Captive Treasure, First Generation, Age of Chaos, Book One, written by Debbie Civil, narrated by Camille Laakea Wong. Chapter One, Jade, Earth, Silversmith, Massachusetts. I sat beside my foster cousin Charity, impressed by the mountain of gifts stacked in front of her. My meager pile wasn't insulting since the Bain family had only been saddled with me five weeks ago. I formerly lived with the Stevens family up until they decided to move down south to be closer to their grandchildren. Despite our years of peacefully coexisting, they weren't moved to adopt me. Thanks to the Stevens' decision, I was forced to endure the holiday season with people that I barely knew. My foster cousin Charity Bain was short and thin, with wispy blonde hair. Her shoulder blades jutted out, as if she hadn't seen a meal in quite some time. She had thin scars crisscrossing her arms. My working theory was that she had endured some kind of trauma. The way that all of the adults indulged her horrid mood swings supported my assumption. Her blue eyes scowled at my pile, as if the objects were a much-hated ex-boyfriend. Thankfully, Charity and I were the only teens there, since the living room was small and a bit claustrophobic. My foster mother, Jane, a tall, willowy woman with short chocolate brown hair, stood in front of us with the camera, wanting to capture the moment. I had no idea why she bothered. I was turning 18 next month and doubted that she planned on keeping me around past graduation. Jade, smile, she sang. My lips moved up in a tense smile as the flash of her digital camera nearly blinded me. As if not to be outdone, Charity's mother, Mary, stepped forward and enthusiastically took multiple pictures of her daughter. The two identical Bane men were sitting on the worn couch, disinterested by the fanfare. The tantalizing smell of ham distracted them. All right, let's open the gifts, my foster mother cheered. Jade, go on, Charity reluctantly said, her eyes focused on my gifts. I picked up the first wrapped package and noted that it was from Uncle Nathan. I tore off the wrapping paper and was astonished to see that he bought me an Apple Watch. I tamped down my desire to hand the gift back and glanced at the smiling, blue-eyed man. Thank you, uh, Uncle Nathan? I stammered out, my sentence ending in an uncertain question. My uncertainty remained when Mary scowled at her grinning husband. He isn't really your uncle, Charity's mom hotly said, her gray eyes lacking warmth. Nonsense, Mary. You heard what the commander said. Jade is one of us. His words threw me off. I eyed Jane, whose eyes briefly widened in surprise before she composed herself. Jade, ignore them, Jane said through a tight smile. Why don't you open the present for me and your father next? Despite the fact that I wasn't comfortable calling perfect strangers mom and dad, Jane and Tim had no such hang-ups claiming me. I was dying to ask Jane and Tim who Mary was referring to, but I didn't want to rock the boat. Instead, I unwrapped the gift from my foster parents, a beautiful comforter set, which was both thoughtful and practical. I thanked them and opened the next gift, from Charity. She'd bought me a makeup bag with lotions and lipstick stashed inside. Charity, thank you, I said. She nodded, delight flashing in her eyes. When I reached for the fourth box, my foster cousin stiffened, which made dread fill me. What was wrong with her? Was there an explosive wrapped in the snowflake Christmas paper? I did notice that the writing said, From Mrs. Bain. She definitely didn't want me calling her auntie. Wanting to get it over with, I ripped the package open and blinked in surprise. I read the big, bold black letters twice before they could register to me. DNA. Uh, thank you? I wasn't sure how to feel about being given such a gift. Everyone should know where they truly belong! No matter what the commander says, you aren't family. Jane's eyes widened when she squatted down to see the box in my shaking hand. Mary! Jane hissed as she got to her feet. Was that necessary? What did she get her? Uncle Nathan asked, his tone hard. A family heritage kit! Jane cried. It was given with thought. Unlike you, I'm not willing to play make-believe! Jane, she doesn't belong in our world, and you know it! Mary yelled. I glanced down at my mocha skin and felt uneasy. In a way, Mary was right. No one knew where I came from. I had been abandoned in a department store dressing room, and my parents could never be tracked down. I guess she's right, I softly said. Great! Charity, open your presents. 
Mary said. To my surprise, Charity got to her feet and sent a scowl in her mother's direction. Donate them to Charity, or the other foster children that you have been rude to, Charity snapped before storming off. I'll go after her, I volunteered. I rushed up the rickety stairs and knocked on Charity's door. My foster cousin ignored me, deciding to blast a horrid pop song instead. I gave up and reluctantly joined my parents in the living room. I was surprised to see that Jane and Tim were wearing their coats. Well, Christmas was over. In a way, I was flattered that everyone was taking up for me. But it wasn't necessary. I wasn't a member of the Bain family. But before I could protest, Jane handed me the puffy coat that she purchased for me last week. I slipped into it, gathered up my gifts, and allowed myself to be hustled out the door. Aren't you curious? My best friend Sheena Smith asked, her voice reaching me through the speaker of the iPhone that my foster parents thoughtfully gave me. I plopped down in the full-size bed in the room that the Baines had allocated for a foster child. It didn't feel like it was mine. The lavender walls were bare, no rugs adorned the hardwood floors, and I had no mementos scattered on the dresser. Not really, I admitted. Take the test, Jade. You never know what you'll discover, Sheena said. The dread I felt when I first spotted the damned box curled in my stomach. I knew that I was being ridiculous, so I didn't express my feelings to Sheena. And maybe I'll be the tenth cousin of a duchess, I teased, recalling the results that Sheena excitedly posted on Instagram last week. Or a fifth cousin to a rock star, Sheena said, excitement coloring her voice. Like me, Sheena grew up in the foster care system. But unlike me, her foster parents adopted her eight years ago. I wasn't surprised, since my friend was likable, the kind of person that everyone wanted around. I wonder if said rock star will discover that I exist and write me a fat check, I joked, as I heard the doorbell ring. That must have been the Chinese food that Tim ordered. Anyway, it looks like lunch is here. I'm serious, Jade. I think that you should really consider taking that DNA test. Why not? And who knows, maybe you have some long-lost sibling in the world that was abandoned the same way you were. The thought that someone had been discarded in the way that I had been made me queasy. What if my mother was a serial baby dumper? I doubt that I have a sibling, but we'll see, I said, just as Jane's voice reached me. Jade, honey, the food is here, she shouted. I've got to go, Sheena, I quickly said. Promise me that she'll take the test, Sheena insisted. I promise, I replied. Her line disconnected, taking the opportunity to retract my words away. For a moment, I stared at the phone, regretting the promise that I had spoken. Then I stood, put my feet into a pair of fluffy slippers, and rushed down the stairs and into the kitchen. There you are, Jane brightly said as she placed three made-up plates onto place settings. I assumed that the plate brimming with food was for Tim, so I chose the place setting by the fridge. There were already glasses of red wine at each setting. Tim hurried in and plopped down and picked up his fork. Jane joined us, a forced smile on her face. We wanted your first Christmas with us to be special, Jane admitted before she took a bite of her shrimp fried rice. I followed suit, enjoying the flavor that hit my tongue. It is. At least I got gifts, wine, and Chinese food. The Stevens always had me volunteer at the homeless shelter for Christmas. Then, for dinner, we usually had pot roast and pie, I rambled, a poor attempt at placating the Baines. They really didn't have to go through trouble for me. I knew that I was lucky to place in a home at my age. Jade, you deserved a great Christmas. You're a wonderful girl. The praise made me feel awkward, so I took a small sip of the half-filled glass of wine. I'll be burning Mary's gift, Tim said. You can give it to me after dinner. It's okay, I assured. I'm kind of curious. I figured that I could take the test. Great. I'll buy you another one, Jane said. There is no way that you're using hers. I won't give her the satisfaction of believing that she was right. So Jane was being petty. I knew that I wouldn't be eager to use the kit if Jane bought it for me. It's okay, Jane. Let's kill her with kindness, I said. Trust me, if I bake her cookies and write a nice thank you note, it will make her uncomfortable. Tim let out a chuckle. That's a new one. Okay, Jade, let's kill your aunt with kindness, Tim agreed as he happily chomped on a chicken finger. Chapter 2 
Jade, Earth, Silversmith, Massachusetts. On December 26th, I registered with the website and Jane dropped off my sample at the post office, since we didn't have a mailbox. According to the site, my DNA sample could yield results in a month, which was too long for Sheena. I can't believe it will take so long, she cried into the phone. I'm dying to know if you're related to a famous person. Even if I am, what then? It isn't like I could call a famous person and say, Hey, I'm your long-lost cousin, give me some money. I responded as I stretched out on my bed. What if your father is a famous athlete and he didn't know about you? Okay, it was obvious that Sheena had a Cinderella complex, something that living a quiet life had cured me of. I liked the Bain family well enough, and college seemed like a goal that I could accomplish as long as I was given the scholarships I had applied for. But the idea of a long-lost famous father bailing me out didn't cross my mind. Then I'll go from there. But I'm not expecting anything out of this, I said with a shrug. How has your birthday trip been so far? Sheena was vacationing with her family at her aunt's pig farm in Texas. Fine. I wish you were here with me. I miss the city, but fresh bacon is delicious. Sheena gushed. Did your aunt make you help with killing the pig? I wondered, my stomach turning at the thought. Not this time, thank goodness. She... Hold on. I'm coming! Sheena shouted, which made me wince. Sometimes she forgot to pull the phone away from her ear when she shouted to her mother. I've got to go, but I'm excited for you! At least one of us is excited about the whole thing, I grumbled. Oh, stop being a Debbie Downer and start counting down the days, she encouraged. Yeah, I'll see if I can do that, I said, not believing that I could force enthusiasm into me. Anyways, bye Jade, love you, Sheena said. Love you too, Sheena, I replied before the line went dead. On New Year's Eve, I was in the kitchen, baking the thank you cookies for Mrs. Bain. Jane sat at the table, sipping her third cup of coffee. She apparently needed the extra boost so that she could stay up to watch the ball drop. I didn't express any interest in joining them. I'd give the Baines a night to spend alone. The smell of the frozen lasagna that Jane had baked for the occasion still permeated the air. Can you make a batch for us to have? Jane inquired as I placed the cookie sheet into the oven. I faced my foster mom and nodded. This batter makes 48. I say I send Tim with 24 of the cookies and the note, and keep the rest for us, I suggested. 12, Jane insisted. You won't want Mary thinking that you're that grateful. What I was actually trying to do was make peace, since I wasn't going to be around forever. Jane and Tim were nice enough and valued their family. I didn't want this minor disagreement over a foster kid to cause a permanent rift between them. So I baked the cookies, put 12 of them in a freezer bag, and taped a note to it. Then I yawned. I think I'm going to bed, I announced. Jane got to her feet and headed toward the coffee pot. Tired already? Want a cup of coffee? She wanted to know. I never tried the stuff since the Stevens had forbidden me from drinking such mind-altering drinks. No, that's okay, I said, Dorothy Stevens' voice playing in my mind. As long as you stay out of the way and don't cause any trouble, we'll keep you. I needed to make the Baines feel like I wasn't an intruder. Really? Oh, if you're tired, Jane relented, though she did appear to be disappointed. She marched over to me and pulled me into a hug. It's okay, Jade. I get it. You're not comfortable around us yet. One day, I hope that you can see that this is your home. Jane's whispered words made my heart, which usually felt empty, fill with hope for the first time. Could I trust her? I wasn't sure since I only spent six weeks with the Baines. But maybe I could try. I shot Jane a grateful glance before rushing to my room. A blast of cold air hit me as soon as I opened the door. After flicking on the light, I quickly closed the window. How strange, I thought to myself. Maybe Jane had opened my window for one reason or another. I changed into one of my worn nightgowns and was about to crawl into bed when I spotted something. In the middle of the bed, a piece of metal the shape and size of a playing card rested there. Figuring that Tim must have dismantled something, I picked up the piece of metal and discarded it on my bedside table. Instead of investigating those two oddities, I decided to binge watch Top 10 Countdowns on YouTube until I fell asleep. My eyes flew open when I heard what sounded like a vibrating phone. 
Sunlight streamed into the room, announcing a new day. Happy New Year to me, I muttered as I sat up, prepared to snatch the phone that rested on the nightstand beside the piece of metal that I had found in my bed. My eyes widened when the piece of metal glowed for a moment before returning to its metallic color. I jumped out of bed, intending on heading to the exit, fearful that something terrible was about to happen. The dread was urging me to find Jane or Tim. But then I witnessed something impossible. A muscular arm suddenly slid out of the wall by my window, an object shaped like a flashlight gripped in his hand. Before I could scream, a beam of light flew from the device and crashed into my chest, sending me sprawling to the floor. Then, as I watched, the muscular arm briefly vanished. Seconds later, a man walked through the wall and entered my room. He was tall, with long black hair, his honey-brown skin, brown eyes, and the shape of his lips looking oddly familiar. His boots thudded against my bedroom floor as he approached me. I tried to move, but my muscles felt like they no longer existed. The feeling caused fear to nearly stop my heart. He knelt by me, carrying a handheld device of some kind. It was square-shaped, with a spout on one end. I tried to move, but my body didn't comply. The stranger pressed the spout to my forehead, and a buzzer sounded. Son of a... No, wait. Gwen has been trying to get me to work on my swearing. You don't have a hind draw crystal he softly said as footsteps sounded outside the door. I made eye contact with the guy, shooting him a pleading look. He couldn't hurt Jane or Tim. They were good people. As if one of my foster parents could sense that trouble was brewing, there was a knock on the door. The stranger pressed a button, and feeling returned to my fingertips. I tried to move my legs, but they felt as heavy as boulders. Get rid of her, he whispered. Jade, are you coming down to eat? Jane asked. We ordered you pancakes and sausage, your favorite. In a minute, I said through an exaggerated yawn. I'm still trying to get dressed. Okay, Jane said. Then I heard footsteps leading away. Who are you? I whispered. Your brother, David. You know, you really shouldn't have done that stupid DNA test. Gwen and I went through a lot of trouble to hide your results, he complained. You're one unlucky person. Dad was so close to leaving without you. So close to leaving without me? I squeaked, fearing that David was going to kidnap me. He used technology that I had no experience with. Escaping him would be nearly impossible. But I have you now. Are you going to cause trouble? David wondered, as if he were asking me what my favorite color was. I needed to keep my foster parents safe. I should have listened to my gut and tossed that stupid DNA kit in the trash. But I hadn't and I knew that I was going to pay a price. But Jane and Tim didn't deserve to get caught up in all of this. Jane and Tim will worry about me. I can't just disappear without some sort of goodbye, I reasoned. I had the feeling that David would harm my foster parents if they came into my room, but I couldn't leave without telling them something. David shook his head. It's too risky, he said, his gaze suddenly going unfocused. Hold on, let me get Gwen. Hope filled my chest until David pressed something on his dreaded machine and I was no longer able to feel my fingertips. He rushed to my window and walked right through it. Moments later, he appeared hand in hand with a tall girl with similar features to me. What the hell is taking so long? The girl hissed, though her mouth wasn't moving. WTF? What the hell was going on? Our sister wants to say goodbye to her foster parents, David said. I was relieved that at least his mouth was moving. You can write a note or send an email, Gwen offered, but her mouth never moved. WTF? Was she a telepath? An email will work, I decided. Gwen snatched the phone that was on my nightstand and tossed it at me. If you call the police, Gwen will know, David warned, touching the weird device to my skin again. I nodded and shakily opened my email app. Dear Jane and Tim, I'm so sorry that I'm leaving like this. My brother found me. I have no idea where I'm going, but I've chosen to leave with him. I want to let you know that you're the best foster parents I have ever had. I was lucky to have you. I'll miss you dearly. I'm not sure if I'm returning, but if I do, I'll see you. To confirm that this is me, remember what Tim first said to me? Hi, I'm your new dad, Tim. I hope that you're a Star Trek fan. Love always, Jade. It's done. I said as I clicked on the send button. I'll go willingly, just don't hurt them. Gwen took the phone out of my hand and dumped it on my bed. 
Then the device in David's hand beeped, and everything went black. Chapter 3. Gwen. Earth. Silversmith, Massachusetts. David eyed our sister, who was unconscious on the floor at our feet. Then his eyes met mine, and he shook his head. We can just say that she died, he offered. I wished that I could spare Jade Bane from the nightmare that was our father, but knew that our mothers would pay if we failed to bring her to the ship. I shuddered when thinking of the punishments that father could dream up. The others didn't have a window into his mind, so they didn't know how ruthless he truly was. Karen and Lex have been sent to spy on us. Now come on. If that couple finds us, you know what will happen, I warned. David gently lifted our kind-hearted sister into his arms, and I gripped his shoulder. We traveled through the wall beside Jade's bedroom window and out into the frigid winter morning. David rushed us to the flyer, which rested in Jade's snow-covered backyard. David touched the flyer with his palm, and it suddenly became visible. We quickly traveled through the wall, and he deposited Jade onto the seat. I collapsed into the seat beside her. I wasn't surprised when David's communicator rang. David rolled his eyes and rushed for the driver's seat. My brother had lived with our father the longest, which meant that he was familiar with the technology that was used on Naretha, father's homeworld. David and I both had favor with the chauvinistic alien jackhole that spawned us. We were able to access the power that lived in the Hindral crystal that was implanted in our spinal cords when we were infants. From what I understood, only 20% of Narethians actually gained abilities from their Hindral crystals. Dad? David asked as soon as he activated the cloaking technology again. Do you have her? Lord Peirk demanded, his tone conveying his agitation. I couldn't blame him since Jade had been difficult to locate. I imagined that the thought of training her was also souring his mood. Poor Jade. At least I lived with the knowledge that Earth was a temporary home, that my father would bring me to Naretha when I turned 18. She wrongfully assumed that she was an Earthling, a dull race with little potential. The poor thing didn't have a Hindral crystal, since her foolish mother had stolen her away as an infant. Karen would eat the fragile girl alive. Yes, she's asleep, David confirmed. Did Jade put up a fight? Father probably assumed that Jade was as strong-willed as the other females in her bloodline. No, David responded. She seems to take after you. Is that an insult? Father demanded. She thinks before she acts. She went willingly, as long as I didn't kill her parents, David explained. David, I told you, you shouldn't make promises that you can't keep, my father lectured right before Jade's foster parents' house exploded. The explosion was contained, the flames and debris never leaving its target. Before my eyes, the fire died down, only leaving the smoldering remains of where Jade once lived. Lex, that had to be his doing. Since he had no abilities, he feverishly learned how to set contained explosions. He probably created a force field around the house to prevent the other homes from being destroyed. A chill enveloped my body when I realized that I was looking at someone's fiery grave. The fire burned so hot that no one would ever find the remains of the nice couple that had taken Jade in. I shoved away the sadness that wanted to haunt me. I learned from a young age that as long as I didn't get in father's way, he would have no need to terminate me. That wasn't necessary, David shouted. Seriously? The police will assume that Jade had something to do with this. They will assume that Jade was in the house, my father countered. I couldn't risk her parents going to the police. I wished that Daddy Dearest had clued us in before Jade sent the email. Great. Was David supposed to break the bad news, or would I? You should have told me about your plan before I allowed her to send an email to her parents. David said. I was grateful that he took full responsibility for Jade sending the email. Good move. But next time have Gwen consult with me first. I'll have Andrea take care of it, Father said. Andrea was another one of my sisters, who could hack just about anything. Are we clear to take off? David asked. I knew that he felt pity for Jade. She had been determined to save her parents. I made a promise to myself that I'd never tell her of what happened to the innocent couple. Jade was the type that would demand revenge, and no one would ever give it to her. You are, my father said, before two beeps sounded. My father had dismissed us, just like that. 
David let out a curse before the flyer shot into the air, leaving the crime scene behind. Chapter 4. Gwen. Somewhere in Space. It took two hours to arrive at the docking bay of my father's sphere-shaped onyx ship, the Peirx Triumph. The outer port of the ship vanished, and we flew straight into the docking bay, which was a garage filled with different-sized transports. As soon as David parked our flyer, the ship sealed us in. I wasn't surprised to see two five-feet-tall robots pushing a gurney into the docking bay. I couldn't blame Father for not wasting the effort to greet Jade himself. She wasn't implanted with a Hindral crystal, which meant that she had no abilities. What purpose did Jade serve? I couldn't help but think that retrieving her was one big waste of time. The side of the flyer vanished, and David rushed over to Jade and unbuckled her. He carried her out of the flyer and gently placed her on the gurney. I joined David, who walked ahead so that he could press his palm on the wall in front of us. The wall vanished, and we entered the main corridor of the spaceship. I'm going to go visit my mother, I told David in Nerth, the tongue spoken by all Nerethians. Those of us that were deemed useful were given a language implant that made it possible for us to speak Nerth. Father only wanted us speaking English when we were conversing with someone who didn't have the implant. Tell Rose that I said hi, David said. My brother was clearly troubled about something. I could see it in his expressive dark eyes. I'll follow Jade to the infirmary. I nodded, and when we walked into the interior of the ship, I turned left while he turned right. I arrived at the suite that was assigned to my mother and me, and paused in the doorway. My mother was pressed against the wall, goosebumps forming on her naked flesh. Her face was tilted back in pleasure as my father's face was pressed into her chest. I wanted to vomit on the hideous white metallic floor, but I didn't. I backed out of the room, appalled that the door was wide open. I didn't bother closing the door since father's actions always had a purpose. I leaned against one of the onyx walls and took a breath. I kind of wished that I could center myself by looking at a painting or a decoration, but father had no such things on his ship. In fact, all of the walls were painted onyx for a reason that I hadn't cared to find out. Everything to my father was a game, and if he answered a question, he expected something in return. How had my mother been placed in such a humiliating position? Was she pleading with him to go easy on me in case I didn't succeed? Who died? Lena asked as she strolled out of her suite. My sister was beautiful and resembled her twin, despite the fact that they were fraternal. But unlike Jade, she was strong, hard, and didn't take crap from anyone. We found Jade, I said, ready for her usual look of disapproval. She was one of the people that chose to rebel whenever she could. Lena rolled her eyes as moaning traveled into the hallway. Of course you kidnap my twin like the obedient puppy you are, she mocked before storming off. She was the only motherless teen that lived among us useful Peirx siblings, and I didn't understand why. She was moody, rude, and received the most light punishments out of all of us. I doubted that father was going to allow Lena to interact with Jade. He wouldn't risk having Lena's defiant nature rubbing off on her. Besides, it was doubtful that Lena would seek Jade out because... Despite what she wanted us to believe, she also played the game. At the moment, she was left to her own devices. But if she showed any weakness, Karen or Anastasia would find a way to bring her down. When my mother's screaming went to a crescendo, Karen exited her suite, a scowl on her face. What's going on? She questioned. I shook my head, not even wanting to peek in my father's mind. It looks like they will be a while, I groaned. They better not be, Karen said a threat clearly in her voice. Just remember, Mom is his favorite. I didn't want to break it to Karen. My father didn't love anyone but himself. Instead, I rubbed my face. I'm dying to take a nap, I said. That bad? I don't know why father even bothered with that one. She doesn't have a Hindral crystal, Karen sneered. I'm sure she'll be married to some horrible lord by the end of it, I suspected, and Karen nodded. I would much prefer Jade to marry a decrepit lord. I want someone young and rich. Gwen, you better tell your mother where she belongs, Karen warned before strutting back into her room. I didn't enter the suite until my father sauntered out into the hallway. His green silks were in order, his black hair slightly messy. I bit down on a nasty retort. Instead, I took a deep breath. Did you tell my mother that we were successful? I asked. Lord Perk shook his head. Rose is much more willing to try certain things if she knows that her precious daughter's life is in danger. Hopefully, Mom remembered to take the pills that relaxed her after a tryst with my father. If not, she would be up all night crying. 
Well, then I'll see you for dinner, I responded. My father nodded. I have a meeting with the lady. You know I have to assure her that she is the only woman in my life that actually matters, he mentally told me. I hated that he could push thoughts into my head, but I kept my expression neutral. It was a secret that both of us shared. I wouldn't risk Mother's sanity by sharing it with her. Have a nice afternoon, Dad, I said, knowing that Lord Petrick enjoyed the endearment. Will do, he said before walking away. His confident stride pissed me off. But I forced the useless anger down, knowing that the emotion was only going to make me act rashly. Instead, I walked into the suite and glanced around. Our quarters consisted of a large room with two king-size beds, a massive closet, and an ensuite bathroom. Mother's sobbing could be heard, even behind the closed bathroom door. In some ways, I was impatient with the woman who gave me life, not understanding how someone could be so weak. She greatly missed the husband that father murdered. Thanks to her foolishness, the man had been decapitated two years ago. The image of his head resting on a silver platter in the dining room of our luxury apartment still featured in some of the worst of my nightmares, but I'd never let Lord Petrick know that his barbaric act affected me. I'd never expressed the anger that I felt toward Mom for marrying the kind, mild-mannered man. He had a daughter, Amber, a bright light who always smiled. I was pretty sure that Amber was plagued by daddy issues, since her father vanished long ago. She probably thought that Max Garcia abandoned her for a life of luxury, like every postcard Lord Petrick sent her suggested. He was strategic about it, only writing during special occasions. Then he did the whole skipping the occasional holiday act. I liked Amber well enough, though she had quite a mouth on her. But my mother had doted on Amber, showering her with clothes and shoes. I warned her that Lord Petrick wouldn't be happy about it. But she insisted that he had given her his blessing. Well, that was a bald-faced lie. When he saw fit, the Narethian lord struck. And ever since Mother and I had come home on Valentine's Day to find the head on the dining room table, she had been a nervous wreck. Sighing, I hurried over to the bathroom and knocked on the door. I wasn't surprised that no one answered. It was more of a, I'm coming in, kind of gesture. Moments later, I turned to the knob and walked in. Mom was sitting in the tub, tears streaming down her face. She lifted her head, and the tears suddenly stopped. You were successful? Mom softly asked, fear etched on her face. Sure was, I responded. The regret in her dark brown eyes made me a bit uneasy. I didn't desire to get into a pointless argument with Mom again. I feel bad for Jade, Mom said, but you did what you had to do. I wish that Mom could understand that I obeyed Lord Perrick because I was trying to keep us both alive. The monster couldn't live forever. I was biding my time, waiting for our circumstances to get better. Me too. I don't think that she's cut out for this kind of life, I noted, annoyance in my gut. I knew that Jade Bane was going to be a hell of a lot of trouble for David. His harsh rhetoric back in Jade's former home had all been talk. I knew that my noble brother would do anything to keep that fragile little thing safe. I'd do my best to keep her alive to prevent David from getting himself in trouble. But if I had to choose between keeping my mother safe and having Jade avoid a punishment, I'd choose Mom every time. I knew her mother, my mother revealed. We were best friends. Jade is only a month younger than you, Gwen. You knew Nellie? I squeaked, shocked that she hadn't mentioned it before. Did you know that she was going to try and hide her children from Dad? My mother shook her head. No. By then, we weren't talking to one another. Your father had been seeing us both in secret, and... You both chased after a handsome man without caution, I accused, which made my mother stiffen. She briefly closed her eyes before opening them. Gwen, I hope that one day you fall in love. I hope you know what it's like to be loved for who you are and not for what you can do for someone. I hope... I held up my hand and she thankfully quieted. Mom... You know that I'm never going to have that kind of life. I am the daughter of a powerful lord. I'm sure once I marry, it will be to someone that can provide the Petrick house with assets. I know my place, mother, and I've accepted it. I think that it's time that you learn yours, I lectured, not for the first time. I expected her to launch into a speech about how her late husband had been the love of her life. I prepared for the unnecessary hysterics. But then, a defeated expression flew across her face. 
I was nothing like Nellie. She wasn't foolish at all. She saw through your father and tried warning me, but I tossed her out. Had I listened, you would still have a soul. It took a moment for Mom's words to register. She thought I had no soul? Was this woman kidding? After all I had done to ensure her safety, she dared to insult me? I was about to shout at her for the insult when a punishment beam fell from the ceiling and crashed into my mother's shoulder. She began to scream, her body thrashing, water splashing about. I couldn't bear to watch the punishment, so I rushed out of the bathroom and collapsed onto my bed. The punishment light made the person being punished believe that they were suffering a terrible amount of pain. Once the light disappeared, Mother would be fine. Oh my goodness, Gwen, you're missing it, my vapid sister Anastasia said. I had fallen asleep, exhausted from the day's journey. I opened my eyes and glanced at the clock on the wall. Crap, it was nearing dinner. I had to get out of my earth clothing and change into one of my gowns. I'm not missing dinner. It hasn't started yet, I protested as I slipped out of bed. No, silly. You're missing out on the bedding that's going on. Dad is having one of his doctors implant Jade with a hydral crystal, Anastasia reported as she fluffed her blue gown, which was complete with a corset. I highly doubted that Lena approved of her twin suffering through such danger, but I wasn't going to worry about it. Lena wasn't stupid enough to actually voice her opinion. Well, I hoped she wasn't. What are the stakes? I asked as I walked over to the closet. How many days it will take for Jade to die? The doctors told Dad that putting the Hydral crystal in her body is detrimental to her health, but Dad doesn't care. I'm guessing that he really wants to teach her a lesson, Anastasia gossiped. I decided to shut the closet door to get dressed in a loose-fitting green gown. It was the quickest to put on. As I dressed, I couldn't help but think that Father was very cruel. First, he snatched Jade from a loving home, murdered her foster parents, then was potentially killing her. And the worst part of it all was that some of my siblings were actually betting on whether she lived or died. Yeah, Mother, tell me who lacks a soul. Chapter 5. Sheena. Earth. Silversmith, Massachusetts. My eyes flew open, the wave of despair hitting me before I could sit up. It was January 1st, and I had ascended. I wasn't proud of my accomplishment, but that still didn't explain the utter hopelessness that I felt. Fine, I was one of the rare casters that received their powers on their birthday. A millennia ago, the casters allegedly defeated the Olympians. Yes, I'm talking about Zeus and Hera. If anyone dared call them Greek gods to the stuffy casters, they would gasp as if you had said something blasphemous. So after the false Greek gods, who were really aliens, were sent packing, casters began scattering. Due to marrying humans, the bloodlines of the casters were diluted. Then, before coven leaders knew it, only 10% of casters ever ascended on their 18th birthdays. After being adopted by Julia and Grant, two casters who ascended. Celeste, our coven leader, revealed that it was no accident that I had been scooped up by casters. You see, my pediatrician made the habit of testing the blood of all his patients for the enzyme that declared someone a caster, and discovered that I belonged with his coven. So Celeste had ordered Julia to adopt me. I hoped to escape a life of responsibility, but ended up with an unwanted gift. The damned despair wouldn't leave me. My intuition suddenly kicked in, and I just knew that I had to call Jade. I got out of my full-sized bed and glanced around my bedroom. My phone was on my desk, where I abandoned it the night before. I walked over and reached out to pick it up, when I felt a stinging sensation on the inside of my wrist of my left hand. I glanced at my skin and groaned. A silver circle decorated the inside of my wrist, the mark no bigger than a quarter. It was the symbol that appeared on the skin of a caster who was an oracle. Seeing the confirmation that my intuition was telling me something, I quickly dialed Jade's number and pressed the phone to my ear. I was disappointed when my friend didn't answer. Good morning, Amber sang as she flung the door open. I dropped the phone and clutched my chest. Amber had nearly given me a heart attack. I spun to face the girl who shared the same birthday as me. Amber Garcia was beautiful, with olive skin, long jet black curly ringlets, and chocolate brown eyes but she was the type who wasn't concerned with fashion. She dressed in comfortable worn blue jeans, a Nightmare on Elm Street t-shirt, and a pair of ankle boots. Seeing her made me feel really crappy about lying to Jade. The poor girl assumed that I was on some farm, mucking out stalls. 
but my parents warned me that I shouldn't tell anyone about the casters, the protectors of Earth. Amber lifted her hand and a ball of energy floated in the air. So, you're a knight, I said, mentally hating her for having a kick-ass gift. A wide grin split her face, and her joy diminished my feeling of doom for just a moment. But then, the warning flared to life again. I think that something's wrong with Jade, I admitted. Well then, let's go check on her. Get dressed. Ben's downstairs. I'll drag him with us, Amber ordered before running from the room. Amber probably assumed that I had some sort of vision. I wouldn't correct her since I needed her to help me. I ran into my cluttered closet and selected a sweatshirt and jeans, not wanting to take the time to coordinate my outfit. I sensed that time was of the essence. I quickly got dressed, slipped into my boots, and rushed to the bathroom to brush my teeth. Then I hurried down the carpeted staircase and dashed into the kitchen, where my brother, Ben, stood, already in his winter jacket. Amber's waiting for you outside. What did you see? The genuine concern on his face squeezed my heart. I was lucky that Ben and his family had rescued me from the foster care system, despite their motives. I hoped that the Baines could do that for Jade. They were great people with a lot of love in their hearts. Thinking of the couple made my stomach cramp up. Was I wrong about them? Something isn't right with Jade, I said. Ben shook his head. You already told her that you were at a farm. What is she going to think if you show up to her house? Ben asked. But the pain in my stomach only got worse. I feel it, Ben. Something's wrong, I rasped out. Ben sighed. I'll do this for you once, Sheena, but you'll have to cut ties with Jade eventually, he lectured, which pissed me off. Jade was like a sister to me, and I wasn't going to abandon her. Fine, I lied. Ben nodded, and we exited the front door of the cozy two-story home that I had lived in for eight years. Amber had a stepfather that insisted on buying her love with gifts. She was sitting at the wheel of an impressive, sleek SUV. There was snow on the ground, so the vehicle was practical enough. I hopped into the back seat and pulled the door closed. I had forgotten to put on a coat, and the cold air was getting to me. With shaky fingers, I put on my seatbelt. This is the last time you're visiting Jade, Ben said from the passenger seat. Whatever, just drive, I pleaded. I'd tell Ben to butt out of my life after I was assured that my best friend was all right. Amber shrieked and leaped from the SUV, her hands already glowing. Ben followed, but all I could do was stare at the shocking scene. The house where Jade once lived had been utterly destroyed. The diminishing flames were unnatural, based on the fact that they didn't spread. There was no hope of saving Jade and her new family. Had the Olympians decided to make their way back to Earth to tangle with the casters again? If that were the case, why would they have targeted Jade and her family? I heard fire trucks in the distance and guessed that Amber and Ben must have heard them too, because they returned to the vehicle. Amber drove down a few blocks before parking in front of a random house. She then got out of the driver's seat and sat in the seat beside me. Her face was lined with worry. It didn't smell like Olympian magic. It smelled foreign, chemical, like an explosive, but not quite right. We'll have to report this to Celeste. I'm so sorry, Sheena. I didn't sense any heartbeats. Right. Amber was trying to delicately tell me that my best friend and her new parents were dead. My guess was that Ben probably felt too guilty to break the news to me. He had wanted me to cut Jade off. Well, he had his wish. The thought of Jade being dead was too difficult to grasp. There was no way in hell that the guarded, kind girl I had always trusted was gone. And there was no way that the Olympians had decided to punish me by killing her. For one thing, those evil freaks hadn't pestered Earth in thousands of years. And if they were going to bother to make a comeback, they would have targeted one of the covens. That meant that a new threat managed to slip past the caster's guard and attacked innocent people. An unknown alien race? I asked Amber, who looked overwhelmed. Maybe. I'm not sure. But it doesn't smell like one of the Olympians' magic. Julia has a pouch of magical residue saved from an Olympian, and trust me, the that explosion didn't smell like that. Amber noted. I would have asked her why Julia showed her such a powerful artifact, but didn't bother. Amber was one of the rare casters who had been gifted before she ascended, though she was less powerful before she turned 18. Well, Ben? I asked, my anger rising. Aren't you going to say anything? I'm sorry, Sheena. He softly replied, before growing silent. I'm sorry? Those words meant nothing. 
I'm sorry wasn't going to turn back the clock to when I lied to Jade. I'm sorry wasn't going to change the situation. Those stupid words weren't going to bring Jade back. Had I told her, none of this would have happened, I bitterly said. Amber winced, as if she was the one that prevented me from telling Jade my secret. Had she known, my best friend could have spent my birthday with me. Had she known, she wouldn't have been a part of that burning heap. I have contacted Celeste. She's sending casters to assess the situation, Ben said. So he wasn't going to acknowledge what I said. She isn't gone, I said, trying to believe it. No. Jade was captured. That was it. At any moment, a bad guy was going to call me and tell me that he wanted to make a trade. That's what always happened in those crazy movies that Ben liked to watch. Talk to me, Sheena, Amber encouraged. Take me home, I ordered. Jade isn't dead. I'm sure that an unknown alien took her. Amber rested a hand on my arm. That is a possibility, honey, but it's too early for us to tell, Amber softly told me. It isn't a possibility. It's true. There is no way that someone would burn down Jade's house and not ours, I argued. I bet they took her to hold her for ransom. What if they wanted money in exchange for her release? Sheena, Amber said, her gaze filled with worry. I knew that Amber didn't want me getting too hopeful, but I didn't care. Jade had to be alive. I refused to believe that she was dead because of me. There was no way that I would never speak to her again. Jade was alive and breathing, and I was going to find her. She isn't dead, I pleaded. I know that she isn't dead. Chapter 6 Sheena Earth Silversmith, Massachusetts By the time Ben pulled into the driveway of our house, I felt like I had been turned into an ice block. I shivered as I exited the SUV, my knees knocking together. Amber wrapped a supportive arm around me and led me to the porch. Ben jogged ahead of us and got the door open by the time we traversed the snow-covered steps. As soon as I entered the warm house, the smell of bacon cookies hit me. The smell, usually comforting, caused a negative thought to blossom in my mind. If Jade had been caught in the explosion, we would never have hot chocolate and cookies together again. No, Jade wasn't dead. I wasn't sure about Jane and Tim but my instincts were telling me that there was something more to her disappearance. Ben, what happened? My mother, Julia, demanded when Amber helped me into one of the kitchen chairs. Um, Jade and her family were killed by an explosion. We aren't sure if the explosion was magical in nature, Amber hesitantly explained. It didn't smell right. Julia's face grew impassive. Then she poured a mug of hot chocolate and put it in front of me. Honey, you need to focus, Julia told me. I know that losing Jade was a shock, but... No, Jade isn't dead. I can feel it. She's alive. I, I can feel it in my bones, I shouted. You have to believe me. I'm an oracle. Ben rubbed his face, obviously still uncomfortable with being around me. After all, he had been the one to tell me to not interact with Jade anymore. I'll contact Celeste and see if she can send some arson experts to check out the scene. If aliens are blowing up the houses of non-casters, we need to know about it. In the meantime, drink your hot chocolate, Julia replied before leaving the room. Amber took off her coat and handed it to Ben. Make yourself useful and put away my coat, Amber ordered. Ben seemed more than happy to comply, snatching up the garment and running out of the kitchen. Amber sat down across from me, her blue eyes filled with concern. Look, Sheena, you have to get it together. I know it's hard, but you're the first oracle that the Silversmith Coven has had in 50 years. We are all counting on you to give us visions to go on, Amber lectured. I don't know how it works, I said defensively. I didn't bother pointing out that I hadn't yet decided to officially join the Silversmith Coven. Amber closed her eyes for a moment, then sighed. It would help if you had a crystal ball. But you're out of luck, since carvers are as rare as oracles in our coven. Celeste will have to barter with another coven to have one made for you. Until then, you have to wing it. I remember Celeste telling me of an oracle that could see things by touching either a person or an object. Touch your mug, Amber instructed. I touched the mug and didn't get so much as a tingle. I shook my head and took a sip of the hot chocolate. The chocolate did very little to ease my distress. 
I saw nothing, I said, stating the obvious. Damn. Try touching my hand, Amber suggested. I didn't have much hope that it would work, but I reached out and touched Amber's hand. Moments later, I was shoved out of my body and into the not-so-distant past. I appeared in a room with a long rectangular table, white walls, a plush carpet, and a cabinet in the corner. A man with mocha skin and cropped hair stormed into the room, a blue folder in his grip. He sat at the head of the table, a look of impatience filling his face. A woman with long jet black hair and honey brown skin materialized, her dark eyes weary. Rayon, she said, as if she knew that something was coming. Nicole, you know how I feel about this, he snapped. Kira will not enter our world. Sadness entered her eyes at the gruff man's words. Rayon, I don't trust Dayon. He'll use her against us. Sending Angelo was the right thing to do, Nicole defended. You sent Paint Boy to protect Kira? What will he do if he encounters an Ajorian warrior? Turn his skin different colors? Nicole shot Rayon a disapproving look. He graduated at the top of his class. Besides, he was the only one that the commander would spare. It isn't like anyone has any use for him. And he's 21, young enough to fit in. Fine, Rayon agreed, as ten men suddenly appeared in the room. Nicole nodded and took the seat beside Rayon. The other men occupied the rest of the seats at the long table. Moments later, a tall man with wavy brown hair and green eyes appeared. He immediately saluted Rayon. My king, do I have permission to speak? The man asked. Derek, speak, the king ordered. Winston, Tormund, Angelo, Mira, and I canvassed the area. It appears that Jane and Tim didn't have the time to teleport out. They were incinerated. But Tormund sensed that Jade was taken in a transport of some kind. He could trace her energy heading toward the sky, Derek said. What kind of tech? King Rayon questioned. We reached out to Dame, the captain of the Crusher. And he reported seeing a Nerethian spaceship orbiting Earth. The ship was cloaked, but their tech is not as advanced as ours, so Dame was able to see through the cloaking device. We theorized that Jade was taken and was dragged onto the ship, Derek reported. What if Jade was consorting with the Nerethian scum? A man with jet black hair and pale skin demanded. She wasn't, Derek assured. A little boy living next door saw the entire thing. The Nerethian man teleported Jade and another woman out of the house, and they disappeared after a few steps. And then, according to the kid, the house went boom. I managed to erase his memories before he could tell the police, Derek replied. So what? Are the Nerethian scum warring with Earth as well as our people? A short man with chocolate skin asked. You can add the Janton to that list, another man snickered. What now? Nicole wanted to know. We are allergic to Blictar, and most of the Nerethian's infrastructure is made out of the stuff. It would be suicide for me to send people to Neretha, but this cannot be unchallenged. For one thing, Earth is one of our homes. We won't stand for the Nerethians to bring war here. Derek, thank you for your fine work. I just have one question. Have you interviewed Jade's friends? Rayon asked. With your permission, sir, I'd like to start. But since I don't attend Jade's high school... I think that Angelo has a better chance at earning the trust of those kids, Derek pointed out. Right, Rayon muttered. If we're lucky, Kira and Jade hang out a lot. If not, it looks like Angelo will have to balance two assignments. Yes, sir, Derek agreed. You're dismissed, soldier, Rayon said, and Derek teleported away. Do we try to retrieve Jade? The short, dark-skinned man inquired. It depends. Rayon said. Was Jade taken because she was in the wrong home at the wrong time? Are they using her as bait? I jolted in surprise when I found myself in my body again. I blinked several times, trying to figure out why Amber had garnered this vision. From what I knew, she was most definitely not an alien. But then a thought occurred to me. Have you been in contact with Kira Parker lately? I wondered. Amber sighed and nodded. Before I came here, she made me pinky swear that I would never sing again. Amber blurted out, and I let out a chuckle. Kira Parker was a year younger than us, but full of so much sass that it was entertaining. She was also one of Amber's closest friends. Well, um, I have got to tell you about the vision, I said as Ben returned. Vision? 
What vision? Ben wanted to know. Apparently, we're not alone in the universe, I said. Amber quickly fished her phone out of her purse and opened up her memo app. I didn't have to see it to know what she was doing. Knights were trained to record oracles when they spoke. As soon as she nodded, I explained my vision, being sure not to leave out a detail. Kira's Uncle Ray is an alien king? Holy crap! No wonder why he's serious and self-righteous. And Angelo? That guy has been acting like a lovesick puppy since he got to school. Oh, this is rich. Amber rambled. At least you know these people. I said. All we have to do is corner Angelo when he isn't with Kira. She won't believe us if we talk to her about this. Amber shook her head. She'll believe me if I make my hands glow, Amber argued. Amber, we can't expose ourselves to a human, Ben lectured. When Celeste gives us the okay, we'll talk to Angelo. Amber nodded and began texting. Then her phone dinged. Celeste gave us the go-ahead. We'll corner and fry the alien if he plans on hurting my bestie, Amber threatened. I nodded, knowing that I would have said the same thing if it were Jade. Chapter 7. Jade. Location unknown. It was toasty warm and my body felt relaxed. The mattress was feather soft, my fingertips tracing the crisp sheets. I slowly opened my eyes and was greeted by an unfamiliar environment. Moments later, the bizarre events of New Year's Day floated through my mind. I had been snatched out of the Bane's home by two strangers that looked a lot like me. I slowly sat up and was relieved to discover that my movements were not impeded. Then I glanced around the place. The walls were onyx, the metallic floor was painted off-white. There were three closed doors and a row of empty full-size beds just like the one I was lying on. I counted six beds, including mine. Were there other captives? Were David and Gwen planning to abduct more unsuspecting teenagers? I decided to explore the prison. I stepped onto the warm floor and hurried to the door closest to me. I was disappointed to find that it was a closet that held worn gowns of all sizes and colors, along with a variety of shoes. I closed the door, hoping that I hadn't been snatched by a man that had a thing for young women that played dress-up. Then I opened the second door, which was a spacious bathroom complete with a shower, a tub that someone had to step down into, and a double sink. I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and frowned. I was wearing a silk nightgown that went down to my ankles, and my black hair had been French braided. My nails, which were usually ragged, were manicured, along with my toenails and my eyebrows. So you're the vain type? An amused female voice asked. I squeaked and spun around to see a short girl with bouncy curls that framed a beautiful face. She, too, had a lot of my features, though her skin was a beautiful shade of olive and her eyes were blue. Who are you? Where am I? Did David hurt Tim and Jane? I demanded, my pulse rising. David only said that he would hurt your foster parents in hopes that you would willingly go with him. That's what David and Lex were talking about at breakfast, the girl explained. I'm Amy, by the way. And, oh, you're on a spaceship heading for our new home. What? I cried. That can't be. It can. For twelve years, our man whore of a father prowled Earth and impregnated one woman per month. He would keep up with the women, monitor their pregnancies, then, once the children were born, he would implant them with a hydral crystal and a tracker. You got neither treatment because your badass of a mother found out, left you in the department store, and attempted to kill your father. She was broke and alone, so had no other place to hide you. Well, since our, uh, father is an alien, you know that it didn't go well. One of your father's guards shot her with a tranquilizer that she had an allergic reaction to. I'm sorry, Jade. She didn't make it. Amy said, and a tear ran down my cheek. I had assumed that my mother was a baby dumper, someone not worth looking for. But she gave her life trying to fight for me. And our father didn't realize that I was the baby left at the department store? I asked. She lied, telling him that she murdered you, Amy explained. What was my mother's name? I demanded, wanting to put a name to the story. Nellie, she responded. So let me sum it up. As soon as the human our father got pregnant gave birth, he injected the women with a drug that made them infertile. They were then told that they belonged to him and were now part of his harem, she revealed. And what about us? I wondered. The six of us are motherless. My mother died in a car crash last year. 
Nina's mother died two years ago from a drug overdose, and the remaining girls lost their mothers through cancer. She said, Do you have proof of all this? I asked. We're really on a spaceship? Come on, Amy calmly said. I followed my supposed half-sister out of the bathroom and over to one of the onyx walls. Amy tapped the wall once, and the wall transformed to the view of space. I gawked at the stars, wondering if this glorious view could be fabricated. It was shocking, not being able to spot a landmark in the vastness. My heart rate picked up when I realized that I was now subjected to the whims of a stranger who killed my mother. You were asleep for five days. They implanted a tracker and hydral crystal in you, Amy explained, which made my eyes widen. Surgery? Where? I cried. Amy shrugged. I think that the hydral crystal and tracker are implanted in the spinal cord. You don't have a scar, since the mender would have taken care of that. The hydral crystal is supposed to draw out your gift. Gift? I asked, unsure. What do you mean? We have a trainer that's been trying to draw out our abilities. Gwen can mentally communicate with people. Yeah, I noticed. I grumbled. David can walk through walls. Amy added. Can you do anything? I questioned. Not yet, Amy said. Does any of our siblings have children? I asked, worried that a second generation of aliens would be expected to use Earth as a breeding ground. Only the married ones have children. We have to stay pure until our wedding night. Apparently, that increases our value. Amy scowled. Okay. Um, the clothes in the closet? I asked. Amy glanced down at her casual dress. All clothes that our seamstress has created for us. You should know that the six of us are father's throwaways. We have no mother, no powers, and no charm. How does he know if I have charm? He hasn't even met me yet. I challenged. Amy nodded. Just know that father and his wife aren't going to be kind to you. She warned as the door flew open and a teenager wearing a drab blue dress splattered with red paint ran in. She was gorgeous with red hair and fair skin. She was followed by a beauty with olive skin and dark brown hair. As soon as the door slammed shut, they both glanced at me. Jade, you're awake, the redhead said. I can't believe that the two-faced ca- I squealed as a ball of light the size of a grape fell from the ceiling and crashed into the redhead, who began screaming. I rushed forward, intending on helping the flailing woman, but arms wrapped around me from behind. Don't, Amy hissed. If you touch her, the pain will increase. The redhead abruptly relaxed and stripped off her ruined dress and went into the closet. She appeared moments later carrying an armful of clothes, then headed into the bathroom. Nina, what happened? Amy asked, exasperated. Karen splashed Molly with her paint. She thinks she's all that because Dad has been visiting with Karen and her mother. I don't think that Lady Valera is too pleased with that. But Karen's mother, Meg, is a hot personal trainer, Nina explained. Dad? You know him well? I asked, surprised by how casually Nina had said the word. Not really. We haven't been on the ship long enough for me to talk to him. This ship has orbited Earth for six weeks. Dad had some business on Earth. While I was on Earth, Dad only visited me twice a year. Nina said as the door opened yet again. Gorgeous identical twins strolled into the room and scowled when they saw me. So, the princess is finally awake, the one wearing the blue gown said her brown eyes shooting sparks. I'm sorry. I had surgery. It wasn't like I chose to be unconscious, I argued. Ignore hope and faith. Neither of them have accepted that they are trash like us, Molly shouted from the bathroom. Both brunettes scowled in the direction of the bathroom. You have to get dressed for lunch, Amy said as she dashed into the closet. She isn't wearing any of my dresses, the twin in green protested. None of the dresses are yours, Amy said as she retrieved a yellow casual dress for me. You heard father. The only thing that we don't share are undergarments. The girl in blue scowled, but shook her head. Princess, we'll let you slide this time, but watch your back. The girl in blue threatened before storming out, her twin flipping me off before following behind her sister. Do you know where the spare fabric is kept? I asked Amy when she handed me the dress and a bra to wear. I quickly changed, folding up my nightgown and stashing it under my pillow. I know where it is, Molly said, as she came out of the bathroom fully dressed. What's it to you? Do you think that father would mind if I made a few dresses? I love to sew, I lied. The truth was that I had been forced to make my own clothes growing up, 
since Mrs. Stevens ordered me to do so. Yeah, he wouldn't care about that sort of thing. Come on, I'll show you where it is after lunch, Molly agreed as she linked her arm through mine. The hallway of the ship had the same color scheme of our bedroom. I was startled to see a robot walking past, carrying a heavy box. But by the time we made it up another level, the sight was becoming normal. I had been given a pair of slippers to wear with my dress that were a tad too small. I tried my best not to limp. Isn't this place charming? Molly asked with exaggerated excitement. Where is everyone? I asked, confused. Already sitting in the dining room. We're late, which is a usual occurrence for us since we don't care about impressing him, Molly said, and Amy nodded. Nina, who was walking behind me, spoke up. I just want to go home, she said in a small voice. Who doesn't? Molly laughed as we turned left. Two tall men wearing green military-style uniforms were standing on either side of the hallway. They nodded at us as we headed toward an oak door. Amy pulled the door open and waved us through. The room was also onyx. The floors painted a brilliant gold instead of off-white. There was a dais where a tall, thin man with tan skin and cropped black hair, wearing fine silks, sat across from a short, thin woman with brown hair that was up in a complicated updo that was laced with thin gold chains. She wore a gold gown that made me feel underdressed. There was a long table that sat four finely dressed girls, two guys in silk, and five middle-aged women who were all in black. Amy headed to the third table, behind the long table. It was dressed in a simple cloth and held a meager offering of food. The twins were already there, scowling at the four of us for walking in. Before we could sit, a booming voice halted us. Jade, good to see you awake, my supposed father noted. Next time, work on your walk. Laughter filled the room, but I ignored the self-righteous people and sat down in a seat. The man knew damn well that the shoes didn't fit me. He was just being cruel. The twins snickered as they helped themselves to what looked like a week-old loaf of bread. Servers came in with plates of meat for the other people, and cold soup for the throwaways. The injustice of it all caused me to get to my feet. "'Where are you going?' Amy cried. I ignored Amy as I followed the servers out of the room, down the hall, and into the kitchen. The room was teeming with staff that were chopping vegetables, rolling dough, or preparing heaps of meat. I searched until I found the person in charge, a hulking man wearing a brown uniform and a gray hat. I walked over to him, purpose in my steps. "'Excuse me, sir?' I asked in English. It took me a moment to realize that everyone was speaking a foreign language. Hopefully, if I mimed my actions, things would be easier. He turned to face me, his brow arched. He said something in the foreign tongue, and I shook my head, indicating that I didn't understand a word that he said. Then, I walked over to a rack of pots and selected one. I quickly placed the pot on the stove. I walked over to the shelf of cooking utensils that weren't all that different from earth utensils and selected a spatula. And then I gestured to the spice rack. Thankfully, the guy in the cap followed me around, watching the show. He grinned with excitement and took me to where the food was held. The room was freezing, but I collected my food wisely. I selected a slab that looked like roast, and green pear-shaped vegetables to start. I rinsed the meat in the sink before placing it in the pot. I sniffed the spices and used them liberally. I gestured to the cooking appliance, and the chef gestured to the knob on the left. I turned it until the meat began to simmer. I then sliced up the strange-looking vegetables and went into the food room to retrieve more. I also toured the pantry and decided to use a can of sauce that smelled all right. After that pan was simmering, I went back to the storeroom and found the stuff to make dough. I decided to be spiteful and chose a spot on the counter, and proceeded to attempt to make a pie crust. To my surprise, it actually worked. I heard a can of something being placed beside me and turned to see a grinning kitchen worker. She gestured at my dough and I nodded in understanding. I opened the jar and discovered that it was filled with some sort of pastry filling. I quickly poured it into the pie, then another worker placed it beside the roast. Apparently, the alien stoves prepared food at a faster rate. In less than 15 minutes, my pie and my roast were finished. I snatched up a cart and loaded the food onto it and hobbled out of the kitchen. My dress had a bit of flour on it, but I ignored the mess and walked into the dining room. Girls, I made us all lunch, I said to my five roommates before uncovering the dishes. Molly was the first to move, helping me put the roast and the pie on the table. Molly served herself some roast and took a bite. Her face lit up with pleasure, though her eyes began to water. Spicy, but delicious, she exclaimed as I plopped down. Nina, who had been dunking the dried bread into the soup, sliced up some of the meat and added it to her bowl, so I did the same. I took a cautious bite and determined that the food was good, but a bit too spicy. 
I'd have to watch my measurements in the future. Even the hateful twins partook, seeming excited to be tasting real meat. The lady of the house came over to our table, a scowl on her face. What's this? she asked in accented English. I made some roast and pie, I said. Want some? It was like the idea of me cooking was foreign to her. My father joined her, helping himself to a piece of pie. He took a bite and grinned. I haven't had pie in a while. Jade, give Cook the recipe, he demanded. Can I have books on how to learn to speak your language? I asked, which made my father laugh. Sure, I'll give the books to you. But you won't learn the Narethian language, he taunted. So that's what we were. Part Narethian. I had figured that out without even asking. Okay then, we have a trade, I said, a new plan forming in my head. Valera sliced off a piece of the roast and popped it into her mouth. Spicy, but good, she critiqued before waltzing back to the dais. We spent two hours eating the meal, me being happy that I had saved my sisters from the horrible soup and dry bread. Molly led Amy, Nina, and I to the fabric storeroom. A seamstress was in there, conferring with Gwen, who was standing on a pedestal. I was surprised to realize that they were both speaking in the Narathian language. How can she speak Narathian so well? I whispered. Dad gives the translation chip to his favorites, Molly said in a loud voice. Gwen glanced at us, arching a brow. The seamstress shot us a venomous glare before gesturing at the door. I shook my head and began walking through the racks of fabric. I selected six bolts of fabric and took one of the baskets filled with sewing supplies and walked over to the seamstress. Amy gestured to me, the basket, then made an away gesture. She nodded, and I escaped to our room with the supplies. By the time we returned to the room, there had been a desk added to our abode, along with a stack of books and a tablet. The twins were sitting on their beds, which were closest to the window that Amy had made appear, and were frowning at us. I cleared my throat, determined to speak my plan. It's obvious that we're the low of the low, I said, so we'll have to learn the language ourselves. And what about the fabric? The twin in blue demanded. I know how to make my own clothes, I said. Good, then we will no longer have to share with the four of you, the twin in blue huffed before leaving the room. I hadn't even gotten the chance to offer to make them dresses. Chapter 8 Gwen, Somewhere in Space Kala frowned as she peered at Jade's retreating back. Narethian females weren't usually so bold. In fact, poor Kala was probably shocked that Jade had dared to approach her without an escort. I was currently waiting on my brother Lex to collect me. Father wanted us to spar, a feat that I wasn't looking forward to. She will attempt to make her own dresses? The seamstress inquired, doubt in her voice. We believe so my father said as he strolled into the room, followed by a smug-looking Lex. The guy enjoyed knocking me off kilter. He was envious of the fact that my Hindral crystal gave me access to useful abilities. I reminded myself of his insecurities, dreading what he was going to do because of them. Lord Petrick! Kala cried as she dipped into a flawless curtsy. Since I was one of his offspring, I didn't have to show him such formal respect. Kala, allow Jade to take as much fabric and materials as she likes. My lady and I want to see if she can actually construct a gown. It's been a tiring trip. We need entertainment, he said. Lex rolled his eyes, not seeing how any of the conversation was interesting. Gwen, can you stop playing dress up? I want to prove to father once and for all that having a gift isn't going to save any of you ladies from a strong man, Lex taunted. I scowled at him, disgusted by the glee Lex took in taking us down. Right, I muttered as Kala helped me down from the pedestal. Let me help you get out of the gown, Kala offered. Why don't we leave Gwen in that dress, Father suggested. It will give Lex an advantage, since Gwen can read his mind. The bastard was testing me. Tingles formed up and down my spine, the knowledge that I could compel Lex into losing. But Lord Petrick had ordered me to keep that aspect of my ability a secret. Father was testing me to see if I would disobey his orders by displaying the power. Sounds fair, Lex agreed a snarl curling his lip. At that moment, I wanted to quip that he was still sour from how David had handed him his ass, but I wasn't stupid enough to further provoke Lex. He was cold with no conscience, able to blow up someone's house without blinking. Okay, then, Kala responded, her eyes briefly staring at the gown, concern and regret in them. 
The seamstress was probably worried about the dress. I couldn't blame her, but hated that she didn't show an ounce of worry for me. Let's get this show on the road. The trainers, your siblings, and my wife are waiting. By siblings, he meant the ones that were useful to him. Lady Valera made it clear that she wasn't going to mother any of her husband's children, which meant that she had a special distaste for the children that came aboard the ship without a mother. We traveled down two levels and entered another onyx corridor that was wider than most. There was a looming door that led to the testing room. Lex grinned as we approached the door, aching for a win. My father waved a hand, and the double doors opened and we entered the room. It reminded me of a high school gymnasium with the shiny floor and bleachers. But there was no basketball court, and each wall had white, circular crystals that snuffed out fires, in case someone developed an elemental ability, which was unheard of. That's why I wondered why father had bothered with the unnecessary expense. Sitting on the bleachers were four of my siblings. Karen, Lena, David, and Anastasia. Our mothers were seated in the middle row. My father probably hadn't mentioned that Mom was watching my sparring match with Lex just so he could see my look of shock. I forced my eyes to leave my horrified mother. Even Lady Valera was there to witness the fight, in her customary seat in the top row. David looked bored with it all, like he would fall asleep at any moment. He definitely didn't approve of what his father did, but he would do anything to protect Jenny, his soft-spoken mother. The petite woman always went beneath my father's notice, so I didn't think that David had much to worry about. I wouldn't dare to tell him so, since I was in no mood to insult him. All right, my father said. His voice beckoned our trainers, Ken and Berg. The two were tall, thin, and wore decent enough clothing. They were brothers, and the only thing that distinguished them was that Ken had a scar on his forehead. The twins had black eyes and hair as pale as sand. I sighed and waited for them to take their customary seats in the front row. Their jobs were to push us physically and mentally. I recalled the time when Molly grew agitated with one of the trainers and actually gave him a broken nose. He had said something insulting about her departed mother to get a reaction out of her. He had been hoping for a magical reaction, not the physical one. Thanks to her, we were restrained for the mental sessions. Let's make it interesting, my father decided. Goodness, was this man going to add a wager to this humiliating match? Lex, if you win, the useless ones will no longer have access to the trainers, father said. But if you lose, the throwaways will receive all of your training time. If Lex wins, the throwaways should also have their dresses taken away, since Jade has insisted on making them all dresses, Karen smugly added. Agreed, Lord Perk declared. Anything else? If Lex wins, one of the others should marry Lord Shreves, Anastasia added. He may be rich, but that guy is old and ugly. I have no interest in marrying him. Well, it was obvious that my sisters didn't believe that I could beat Lex. Despite the fact that we all had to work on our own agendas, I was still a bit hurt. Great, the Lord responded. I made eye contact with my mother, who seemed horrified by what she was hearing. I stepped onto the mat with Lex, who sized me up. He rushed forward and tossed a punch at me. I ducked it and barely avoided the kicks to my legs. The dress was heavy and didn't give me a free range of mobility. I dove to the ground to dodge the roundhouse kick that Lex was planning on using. I quickly rolled to my feet and couldn't avoid the punch to my jaw. I was just too slow. I saw stars as I stumbled back. What's wrong, Gwen? You can't take a little pain? Lex mocked as he delivered a blow to my face that shattered my cheekbone. I collapsed to the ground, pain radiating in my face. What's wrong, Gwen? You thought that you could beat me? He delivered a kick to my ribs. I sucked in a breath and attempted to roll away, but Lex kept on kicking me until everything went black. I have no idea how she's still alive, Anastasia said. The doctors were sure that she would drop dead soon, but Jade is still healthy. That means that David won the bet. People don't usually survive a hydral crystal implant as an adult. Karen added. I blinked and forced my eyes open. I was in the infirmary, resting in an elevated full-size bed with black sheets. Aside from a slight ache in my body, I felt all right. My sisters were sitting on the two recliners that rested side by side across the room. There was a concealed area with medical tools. What happened? I rasped out. Karen, who was wearing a lavender ball gown, spoke. Lax nearly beat you to death. He would have continued beating you if Anastasia didn't toss him against the wall with her telekinesis. Father gave her a two-minute punishment, Karen summarized. 
I made eye contact with my shallow sister and nodded. I wasn't going to let that monster kill one of my favorite sisters, Anastasia declared. Karen sighed. He was a bit much, but I guess he really wants to become a knight, Karen said. Was Jade told about her foster parents? I questioned. Not that I know of, Anastasia said. I wonder what she will do when she finds out. She is kind, but with nice people, they also express their anger in a more savage way, I warned, and Karen shrugged. Lex was the one that set the explosives. I told him to leave the couple alive, but he said that he wasn't going to suffer a punishment for people that he didn't know, Karen explained. I have a feeling that we made a mistake. I can feel it. Don't worry. Your secret is safe with me, I told Karen. Me too, Anastasia said as she rubbed her forehead. How long have I been knocked out? I wondered. Three hours. The mender healed you well, Karen replied. Lex will pay for this, I vowed. I have no idea why he went so crazy. He is full of hatred, which is strange because Lucy is really nice, Karen said. We'll figure out something when we're on Naretha. Don't you worry, sis. We'll come up with something, Anastasia assured me. In that moment, I was extremely grateful to have Karen and Anastasia. Karen could be competitive and annoying, but there was some good in her. Chapter 9 Gwen, somewhere in space. I walked into my room and stopped short. My mother was sitting on the edge of her bed, her head bowed. That I actually expected. But what I hadn't expected was Lena sitting there with her arm wrapped around my mother's shoulders. It's okay, Rose, Lena softly said. I'm sure that seeing Gwen get beat down like that was hard. But she's all right. I wish I had a mother to cry over me, Lena lamented. Beat down? I hissed, knowing that Lena said those words to get under my skin. The aggressive beauty rolled her eyes. Save the drama, Gwen. We all know that you never had a chance against Lex. He has a lot of anger in him, but don't you worry. He'll get his reckoning. He has made two mistakes too many. Trust me, Lena said, a smirk on her pretty face. You have something planned? I asked. I want in on it. I'm glad to hear it, my sister purred. Your role will be simple. What would that be? I challenged. Be nice to my twin. Earn her trust. Then tell her what Lex did when the time is right. Lena shouldn't have known the secret that Lex, David, Anastasia, Karen, and I shared. I was positive that neither Karen nor Anastasia would have told her such a thing. Perhaps Lex had bragged about killing the couple? I wouldn't put it past him. It's only a matter of time, Rose. Hang in there until then. Lena strutted out of my room, the door closing behind her. I glared at my mother. What the hell was that? I nearly shouted. Why were you talking to her? A tear trickled down my mother's beautiful face. Gwen, I'm so sorry. I wished that I could have protected you. One of these days you're going to find out what I did. I just hope that you forgive me, she said as my father barged into the room with a box in his grip. Gwen, I have something for you, he announced. I knew by the gleam in his eyes that I wouldn't like what was in the box. But I forced myself to smile, knowing that my mother's life was at stake. She may have regretted her choice not to fight alongside Nellie, but she did what it took to keep me alive. I owed her everything. Had she fought, I would have been just like Lena. Or worse, perhaps I would have been like Jade. I shuddered at the thought of being like her. She was kind, but was destined for a bad fate. I shoved the thought of Jade out of my mind and took the box from my father. I quickly opened it and was shocked. There was a diamond choker that I recognized. The green tear-shaped stones on the front of the choker represented my father's colors. I knew exactly what this meant and wasn't sure how to react. Father, I hesitantly said, hope flooding me for the first time. If I was appointed Valera's lady-in-waiting, that meant that I'd have to serve for five years. Then I'd be allowed to choose my own husband. That was the law. Do you accept, Gwen? My father questioned. I took care to avoid glancing at my mother. She assumed that if I married, I'd be able to live happily ever after. That wasn't going to happen. Of course, Dad, I said. Why me? Because the lady favors you, 
the daughter who has the least number of punishments. I know that Hope and Faith were angling for the role, but someone like them isn't what Valera is looking for, he commented. I'm so grateful. I'd be honored to serve your lady. I gushed. I could practically feel my mother's glare. Do me a favor and wear the choker once we land on Naretha. I'd hate to rain on Lex's parade, he said. Of course, father. He beat me fair and square. I lied. In truth, I wanted to deck my father for humiliating me that way, but I understood why he made such a choice. Someone like Lex needed approval. He had to feel special, at least for that day. I'll keep this safe, I promised my father, who nodded before leaving the room. After I stashed the precious box in the back of my closet, I turned to face my mother. Mother, are you insane? I cried. Why didn't you at least thank Dad for giving me this opportunity? I can choose my own future! My mother rubbed her face of her pointless tears. She sure cried a lot. You have no idea what you were meant to be, she softly told me. Your destiny, your very purpose for living, isn't so that you can be a servant. Gwen, trust me. There is a lot that you don't know. I'm just sorry that I didn't listen. Then tell me what you want me to know, I begged. You're too far gone. My only hope is that you don't realize what you're truly capable of, she told me, which was irritating. I did everything in my power so she wouldn't end up as another head on a silver platter, and she wouldn't even encourage me to succeed? What was wrong with this woman? Did she have the desire to live? Or was she so damaged by losing Max that she had given up on life? That was a horrible thing to say, I told my mother as I walked over to the closet. But I won't dwell on that. I have to get ready for dinner. I wasn't surprised when Mom screamed out in pain from a punishment. I shut out her anguish, knowing that she wouldn't be injured by the light. The punishment tricked pain receptors. I changed into one of my gowns and walked over to the vanity. By then, Mom's punishment was over. She got to her feet, her eyes briefly flaring with anger. Then she shook her head and brushed past me on the way to the closet. My mother and I headed to dinner together. I saw Karen up ahead, laughing with hope and faith. The two were angling for higher positions, but I had the feeling that they would be the first to be married off. I walked over to the table holding the six useless daughters and eyed what Jade put together. Pizza? I excitedly helped myself to a slice before sitting at the table assigned to father's favorites. Anastasia eyed the pizza with interest. I took a bite, then reluctantly handed it over to her. She happily chowed down on it, making me regret my generosity. That had tasted wonderful. Lex sat down across from my mother, who was staring at her water glass. It was obvious that she wasn't going to make conversation. Meg and Karen sat at the head of our table, somber expressions on their faces. They knew that something was coming. I made eye contact with Karen, and she grinned like a lunatic. Gwen, how does it feel to lose? Lex asked, his mother wincing at her son's words. Before Lex could say anything else, my brother David joined us. The platter of food had just been delivered when Dad pounded on his water glass with a utensil. I have an announcement to make, my father said in Nerth. We will be arriving on Naretha in two weeks. Then you'll prepare for an auction. I will be selling my eligible daughters off to the highest bidders. David, Lex, you both are valuable sons. David, you'll become a knight. Lex, I have secured a spot at the academy for you. The rest of you need to prove that you're worth presenting to our great nation. I eyed Karen, who grinned. It was obvious that Karen felt like she had the competition in the bag. My father's intentions were made clear in that moment. He had ordered Lady Valera to name me as her lady-in-waiting so that Karen could perform well. For the first time, I wondered if my father really loved Meg. He seemed to spend a lot of time with the woman and doted on Karen. Did Lady Valera have something to worry about? Before I could further consider the matter, Karen stood and stormed over to Molly. For a reason that I couldn't understand, Karen despised Molly. Our sister was sassy, beautiful, and had a big heart. Maybe Karen was intimidated by Molly's stunning good looks? I stood, deciding that maybe I could do something to stick it to Karen. I loved my sister, but she needed to remember that I wasn't one to be trifled with. Chapter 10 Sheena, Earth, Silversmith, Massachusetts The first day of school couldn't come fast enough. Celeste ordered us to approach Angelo in a neutral location. 
That meant that we couldn't just barge into his house. Not that we knew where it was. From what I understood, Angelo's people could teleport. Angelo could protect Kira by day, and teleport to a Grecian villa by night. So I waited two days to start the search for Jade. Good morning, Sheena, Julia greeted as I rushed into the kitchen. My father, Grant, was at the Silversmith Coven's stronghold, doing some business for Celeste. That was the excuse that Julia always fed us, but I suspected that my parents were going to announce a divorce pretty soon. Julia gestured to the plate at the table. She made chocolate chip pancakes that had strawberries and whipped cream on top. She was trying to cheer me up, but the loss of Tim and Jane still wrangled. If I was supposedly some kind of foreseer, why in the hell hadn't I had a vision of the fiery blast? I would have warned Tim and Jane and they would have still been alive. Eat up. I nodded and plopped down in a seat. I took my first bite before I noted that someone was missing. Where's Ben? I wondered. He woke up at three for his workout and ate around five, Julia explained. Yikes. Knights could function on four hours of sleep. As I ate, I was so glad that I was an oracle, a kind of caster that needed at least eight hours to function. It gave me a good excuse to sleep in. Once Jade was safely on Earth, I could tell her about oracles and make the joke. I was sure that she would find something like that really funny. Jade. Where was she? What was happening to her? The thought of Jade being abused made my appetite vanish. I pushed my half-eaten plate of pancakes away. Julia frowned as she collected my plate. You have Angelo on your mind? She wondered. Not just that. I'm worried that he won't tell us anything, I said. Julia finished scraping the remains of my breakfast in the trash and washed the plate. What does he have to lose? Julia asked. You already know about his race, and you know who his king is. My advice is to be transparent. Just tell him who you really are to Earth. Right. Julia was on the Earth's protector's idea. I myself didn't seem like much of a protector. I felt like an utter failure. But I nodded anyway when I heard the car horn. It looks like they're impatiently waiting for me, I said as I made my way to the door. Good luck, sweetheart. I love you, Julia said. I love you too, I replied as I rushed out into the freezing cold. Amber's new SUV was idling in front of my house. I quickly made my way to the back and got in. I wasn't surprised to find myself seated beside Tucker, Ben's best friend. Hey, Sheena, Tuck greeted. Hi, Tuck. Are you going to pretend to be a student? I wondered as Amber pulled away from the house. Nope. Here's your ride since Ben is helping me guard Kira. I have to convince her to skip school, Amber said. Hopefully, Angelo doesn't get wind of that. If he does, he won't show up at school. I doubt that he's there to get a high school education. Smart. Tuck, you and I are questioning Angelo? I asked. Ben let out a sigh. Since I don't actually go to Silversmith High, I need you to lure Angelo out of the school. Tucker instructed. So the entire thing fell on me? Well, no pressure. I could either complain or use my energy on trying to come up with a plan. First, I needed to figure out who this Angelo was. Without Kira, that would be a challenge. But I had a feeling that he would be standing out in the cold, waiting to catch sight of his charge. Since Angelo's particular breed of alien appeared similar in physiology to humans, Angelo wouldn't stick out, so I supposed that I could appear as normal as possible. When we drove into the school, I frowned at the news trucks that were lining the perimeter. Reporters with cameramen were stationed all along the front of the school. No students were in sight. Right. This was the biggest thing that had happened in Silversmith since two teenagers were caught robbing a bank. Of course reporters would want to go to our school in an attempt to gather more information about Jade Bain. Fury filled my heart at the thought that my friend was being exploited. She wasn't a kind, warm presence to these people. She was nothing more than a sensational topic that would increase their viewership. I forced down my anger and spoke. I hope that the vultures don't bother me, I told the casters. They won't, Amber assured. Just act like you don't care and flip them off when necessary. All right. Good luck, everyone, I said as I hopped out of the car and jogged toward the school. The reporters must have been warned against harassing students, because they ignored me as I hurried into the building. I wasn't surprised to see students clustered in the foyer and hallways. The students all shot me pitying glances. Some of the classmates that didn't know me as well glanced my way and turned to whisper to their neighbors. I ignored them and headed to the area where the lockers were located. Amber had told me which locker was Kira's. 
I saw a guy standing across from Kira's locker, his eyes focused on it as if something would magically pop out of it. I walked over to Angelo and held out a hand. Well, I thought that the muscled man with the jet black hair was Angelo. Hi, Angelo, I confidently said, sporting a wide grin. Angelo reached out and grasped my hand in his. Hi, Sheena. I'm sorry about Jade, he said, his kind expression making me feel like we could be friends. Kira is safe, I softly told him. Listen, Angelo, we don't have much time. Let me sum it up. I'm a caster, a protector of Earth. I'm an oracle and saw a vision of King Rayon's. I felt fire travel up my arm and into my chest. My vision blurred for a moment, and then I found myself in a different location. Chapter 11 Sheena Earth Silversmith, Massachusetts You tried to teleport away? I accused as I found myself in a cozy living room. Fear filled Angelo's eyes as they landed on me. What did you do with Kira? Angelo demanded. Nothing. She's with Amber, I assured. I saw that King Rayon put you in charge of her safety. I also know that the Narathians took Jade, I listed. Angelo frowned. Why would they take Jade? He wondered. I don't know. But what we need to do is ascertain what kind of threat the Narathians are to Earth, I admitted. Then, if possible, we need to rescue Jade. Angelo let out a breath. So what can I do for you, Sheena? If your visions led you to me, they led you to a dead end. My kind don't like me much. Because you're the paint boy? I guessed. And he nodded. We need to talk to your king, I insisted. Angelo shook his head. Rayon isn't going to help you find your friend. The Narethians killed his people. He'll demand that the person that performed the act be turned over for execution. If Jade is important to the Narathians, he won't rock the boat by asking for Jade's return, especially if she isn't Najori, Angelo suspected. My only duty is to keep Kira out of trouble. You seem kind of rattled. Why? I demanded. Angelo glanced down at his hands. The Najori don't have the ability to teleport with others. When I teleported away, I wasn't supposed to take you with me, he explained as a short, curvy Hispanic woman appeared in the room. Seriously, Angelo? Cool gift, she said. Mira, not now, Angelo protested. Just here to let you know that Kira is at Amber's house, with a hot guy, she informed him. Amber and Ben are knights, I told Angelo, who frowned. He looked to Mira, who explained. Knights are humans that can apparently shoot light out of their hands. Angelo's eyes widened. You came here believing that humans had no protectors? I asked, puzzled. Angelo sighed. Makes sense, he said. But involving King Rayon won't help you. He'll either imprison you for knowing about our existence, or kill you outright. So, if we help you, it will have to be on our terms, Mira added. Mira, we can't help her, Angelo argued. Our assignment is to protect Kira. Why? I wanted to know. Angelo shook his head. I wonder if Derek and Winston want in, Mira said. Mira, that would leave Tormund alone to guard Kira. That is a terrible idea to- Mira chuckled. That assignment was only given to us because King Rayon can't stand people like us, Mira pointed out. Besides, Winston's father owns a ship. Without Winston, this mission won't happen. What do you want out of this, Mira? Angelo questioned. Mira shook her head. Let's just say I hope that we're wrong. Mira answered, before vanishing. How in the hell did this go from speaking to King Rayon to possibly hitching a ride in space? I was terrified by the idea of interacting with such an aggressive race. Angelo blew out a breath. Winston will come with us for sure. He's bored and doesn't like staying idle for long. I have to go to keep Mira out of trouble. Tormund will want to come as well, but I'm not sure about Derek, he listed. What if we assigned a knight to protect Kira? I know that Amber has a few cousins that already go to her school, I bargained. Angelo shook his head, worry and concern warring in his eyes. I don't want to leave Kira alone on Earth, especially since the Narathians are snatching people, he said as Derek appeared in the living room. I remembered him from my vision. His green eyes must have increased in beauty. I met his gaze. A tidal wave of heat crashed into my core. For a moment, the world grew blurry. 
After a few desperate blinks, my vision returned to normal. Derek's eyes widened in shock. So, he felt what I had. Derek was more handsome in person, his presence capturing my soul. His dark hair was thick, lush, and had a hot, messy quality that filled my mind with naughty images. Hi, handsome. I had a vision of you. I blurted out, feeling nervous. I know, Derek said, as his gaze continued to imprison me. Angelo let out a curse under his breath. So, you're in? Angelo asked, uncertain. The casters can protect Kira, Derek assured Angelo as Mira returned, followed by two men. The first stranger was good-looking, with dark brown hair, chocolate brown skin, and sparkling brown eyes. The other guy looked like Angelo's twin, aside from the fact that his eyes were a darker shade of brown. So, Mira wants to venture to the hellhole known as Naretha to save a human that no one really interacted with? Angelo's near double questioned. There is more to this. She's blocked her thoughts, so I can't dig around, Derek replied. Figures, but I'm in, the other stranger said. I like an adventure. Derek, why are you staring at the oracle like that? Because she is his soulmate, Mira snapped, anger flashing in her eyes. Derek shifted on his feet as my mouth popped open. Mira couldn't be serious. I barely knew the guy. What did she mean by soulmate? Oh, damn. By the way, Sheena, I'm Winston, and that's Tormin, Winston said, gesturing at Angelo's lookalike. Sheena, are you Najorian? No, I responded, my throat tightening. To sum things up, Najorians can only procreate with their soulmates. It's a biological defect that I don't quite understand. That means that we're going extinct, since very few of us in our generation have found our compatible, Mira explained, sadness momentarily filling her eyes. No, I protested, though my intuition sang that Mira was telling the truth. One thing at a time. How many people can fit on your ship? Twelve people can comfortably fit on it, Winston replied. I'm sure that Ben, Amber, and Tuck will want to come, but we will have to consult our coven leader first. Do you people have cell phones? I asked as I dug my phone out of my coat pocket. Derek held out his hand and I gave him the device, my nerves singing when his fingertips brushed mine. I didn't miss the possessive intent behind his actions. He wanted to be my point of contact. As soon as he was finished inputting his number, he handed me the phone. Angelo, can I please have a ride back? I asked after a few awkward moments. Angelo stepped forward as Derek scowled. Sure, Angelo said as he held out his hand. I took it and felt that odd burning sensation again. Moments later, Angelo and I were back in the same hallway, which was deserted. Thanks, I said. The alien nodded before vanishing. It looked like I could either attend class or get the hell out of the building. I pulled out my cell phone and decided to create a group text chat with Amber, Tuck, and Ben. Me. All set. Just finished meeting with Angelo. Things didn't go according to plan. Tuck. What happened? Me. He teleported me back to his house. I'm back at school now. Tuck, I'll sneak out the back. Amber, how do we know that it's really Sheena? Me. Stop being so suspicious, Amber. I ran out the back door, wincing as the wind slammed into my face. I skidded on the stairs as I rushed down them. I spotted Amber's SUV driving into the back parking lot, and I quickly hurried toward it. I hopped into the front passenger seat and grinned at a relieved Tuck. So you really are okay, Sheena? Tuck wanted to know. Sure am, I confirmed as Tuck drove off. We met in my kitchen. I was settled at the kitchen table with a cup of hot chocolate in front of me. Mom joined us, her dark eyes filled with hope. Amber paced as if she had been bitten by the energy bug. My brother and his best friend, Tuck, both stared at me. I had no idea where to start. Well, um, Angelo's friend Winston can give us a ride to Naretha, I announced, and Tuck's eyes bulged out. Amber stopped pacing and whistled. Great, she said. When can we leave? Julia shook her head. Sheena, I talked to you about this before. You need to start telling people what happened from the beginning, Mom lectured. I nodded and gave the knights in the room a rundown of everything that had occurred. So Mira has an ulterior motive? Tuck asked. Most likely, 
She has no other reason to help us, I replied. And you think that you should go? This Derek may be your soulmate, but you're the only oracle in our coven, Ben argued. But I knew that he would oppose me going. I need to go. My visions could be useful to the mission, I pointed out. Might is the key word, Ben fired back. There is no sense in... Since Sheena hasn't officially joined our coven, she can do what she pleases, Julia interrupted, which made Ben's face darken. So you're saying that you don't care about Sheena's safety? Ben challenged. I'm saying that if you tell Sheena not to go, she will just leave without you. Derek is her soulmate, not yours. He'll side with her and leave you on Earth. Do you want that? Julia asked. Tuck and Amber both nodded in agreement, which confirmed that I was the one with leverage. I liked the fact that my mother always respected my wishes. How do we even know that Derek is her soulmate? Ben hotly demanded. We don't. But either way, this is your best way to find Jade, Julia responded. Ben rolled his eyes. Why should we risk our only oracle to find Jade? Ben shouted, but then he realized what he said. His words caused anger to flow into me. I stood, my legs shaking from the emotion. You don't have to go to Naretha with us, but I will be going once Queen Celeste clears it, I declared. Julia let out a breath. Let me confer with Celeste she offered before leaving the room. Relax, Sheena. It might take a few minutes, Tuck encouraged. I nodded and collapsed into a chair. We sat in silence, my glare at Ben not doing much to make anyone eager to talk. I finished my hot chocolate by the time Mom came back into the room. She looked exhausted and worried. We were obviously not going to like what she had to say. Ben, you are expected at the stronghold. Your father needs your help on a project. Tucker, you are being sent to guard another potential oracle. Amber, you'll be allowed to go to Naratha with Jade. Ben swore and got to his feet. I thought that he would rant and rave about everything, but then he proved me wrong by walking out the front door, Tuck quickly following after him. I guess it's just going to be us then, Amber said, a smile on her face. This should be interesting. Chapter 12 Jade, somewhere in space. It's an insult, Molly roared as I handed her a casual dress that I had made for her. I had to learn the Narethian numbers in order to use the measuring tape in the sewing basket, but that had taken less than an hour. It had been four days since I began studying the Narethian language, which was called Nerth, and I already had a handle on it. I was confident that in a few weeks I would be as fluent as anyone with a translator chip. I had always had a talent for languages. We don't have gifts, I argued, not offended that the trainer didn't call on us. I spent our free time teaching the girls how to sew, which was difficult for everyone except for Nina. See if that fits you, I said. Molly stripped out of her dress and slipped into the finely made day dress that I spent two days sewing. I used the tablet to research Narathian fashion. Her dress was fit for a lady and had beautiful lace sewn onto the cuffs. I was excited when the dress fit her like a glove. She smirked as I handed her another dress, in a different color, and squealed when it fit her as well. Nina was the easiest to sew for, since she was shorter than the rest of us. And it also helped that she was able to assist me. I was about to start working on a day dress for me, when the door burst open and a furious Amy stormed in, along with the smirking girl that I hadn't met before. The two of them were followed by a soldier who was pushing a cart that was carrying a trunk. What the hell? Molly glared at the homely-looking stranger. Lady Valera ordered me to take all but one of the dresses that the seamstress made for you. For now on, you're to only wear your own creations, the soldier announced. Seriously? Why? I questioned. Why do you care? You're a master seamstress and can make your own clothes, the girl with the soldier mocked. Amy sighed and selected a dress for each of us to keep, while Molly struggled to contain her anger. The soldier leaned against the wall and pointed at the closet. Put the clothes in the trunk, he ordered in English. I was about to comply when Molly glared at him. If you want our clothes so badly, you take them, she argued. If you disobey, you're liable to get punished for ten minutes, the girl threatened. I'm sure you'd love that, Karen, Molly said as she walked into the closet. 
I eyed Karen, who had long black hair and a plain face. She seemed to enjoy what was transpiring. I got to my feet and walked over to the closet, and started grabbing clothes to put in the trunk. Well done, throwaways, Karen mocked before flipping us off and leaving the room. The soldier nodded his head at us and followed behind the brat. Blame Faith and Hope for this. They think that if they make our lives miserable, it will make Lady Valera choose them to be ladies' maids, Amy revealed. I sighed. Where's Nina? I inquired. She'll be back soon. She went to get more fabric for us, Amy said as she eyed me. Is there anything I can do to help? Learn the Narathian language. Trust me when I say that their culture is complex, I said. Amy groaned and sat at the desk, where I usually spent three hours a day. I spent less time making our meals, since the girls already knew how to make a few edible dishes. I groaned and started working on my day dress. I pushed my cart of food into the room, hoping that the next meal would impress my father. Thus far, he had requested three recipes. The pie, the pancakes, and the apple turnover. Nina's eyes lit up when I produced a couple of large pizzas. I placed all of them on the table, then sat down. I was wearing one of the dresses that I had sewed. It was nowhere near as fancy as the gowns that the people at the other tables wore, but I figured that I'd focus on making formal gowns last. I now owned a pair of silk slippers that fit me, thanks to the bargain that was struck when Father requested the recipe for apple turnover. I haven't had this in months, Nina said as she selected a slice. I made a veggie pizza and experimented with two common meats found on Naretha. Myrrh, which tasted like chicken, and soot, which had the texture of steak. Gwen snagged a slice of pizza on the way to her table. I was in the middle of biting my first piece when I heard the sound of silverware tapping on a glass. I have an announcement to make, my father said in Nerth. We will be arriving on Naretha in two weeks. Then you will prepare for an auction. I will sell my eligible daughters off to the highest bidders. David, Lex, you both are valuable sons. David, you will become a knight. Lex, I have secured a spot at the academy for you. The rest of you need to prove that you're worth presenting to our great nation. I clearly had a lot of research to do. Amy's gaze connected with mine, and I nodded to verify that I understood what my father said. As soon as he stopped speaking, Karen strutted over to our table. Cute dresses, but having someone that can do a peasant's job won't put you ahead. Poor Molly, you have no idea what Dad said. Well, let me make it clear. I'll make sure that your husband is ugly and cruel, Karen sneered before strolling away. Molly scowled, but I gestured to the food. I knew that the girls couldn't possibly learn Nerth without the translators, but I would do my best to teach them. This isn't half bad, one of the twins said. I couldn't tell them apart, which made me feel terrible. At least it isn't bread, the other one interjected. They were still in their plain clothes, their scowls diminishing their beauty. I felt pity for them, but they would see once and for all that Karen was only using them. Spill it, Jade. Why did Karen threaten to arrange a terrible marriage for me? Molly demanded. Father is hosting some kind of auction when we arrive on Naretha, I began, before explaining what he said. The twins scowled at me the entire time. I ignored their rudeness and decided to fill the brats in. This was the only favor that I would ever do for those no-good women. Impressive, Gwen said as she reached over and snatched another slice of pizza from the platter in front of me. It took you all of a second to learn Nerth. I shrugged. I'm good with languages, I responded in Nerth, which made one of the twins glare at me. Show off, she huffed. You know, Faith, Hope, I'd listen to Jade if I were you, Gwen said before walking back to her seat. Do you think that Gwen can beat Karen? I wondered. Molly shook her head. Gwen is smart, but isn't talented in the way of combat, Amy added. Karen will wipe the floor with you, Molly. You were stupid for ever getting in the way of your betters, one of the twins commented. I don't get it, I said, puzzled. We're siblings. Why the hate? Unlike you, the rest of the people here want Dad's attention, Nina softly whispered. I was trying to learn as much as I could, not wanting to be dropped in the middle of Naretha without a clue of what was going on. Now I had to worry about keeping Molly alive? How could I protect my sister? Karen will protect us, 
one of the twins said. Unlike you, we have made ourselves useful. The only thing that you have done thus far is sell us out, Molly fired back. What good will that do when Karen ditches you? You won't be able to come crawling back to us. Why is she talking, Faith? Hope asked. Because Karen hasn't beheaded her yet, Hope said before spilling Molly's water glass. She must have used too much force, because the glass rolled off the table and shattered. The entire room went silent. A guard burst into the room and pulled Hope from her seat and dragged her out of the room. I eyed Molly, whose face paled. She's in trouble? I whispered to Nina. She purposefully broke a glass, Nina explained. Why is that important? I whispered to my timid sister. Lady Valera is sensitive about her china being broken, Nina softly replied, which gave me the chills. I eyed Faith, who was silently crying. Molly, who was mostly dry, shook her head. I figured that it wasn't time to ask the others what would happen to Hope, so I forced myself to continue eating. Father wasn't tempted by the pizza, which was disappointing, but at least it tasted good. After my father and his wife left the room, everyone followed suit. Without hope, Faith seemed defeated. She had stopped crying, but her eyes were red. Karen was up ahead, talking to Lex, the brother that I had never met before. A scream caught me off guard. I winced, but everyone kept on walking. I halted in front of the door where the female was screaming. Amy tried to pull me along, but my sense of righteousness couldn't allow me to ignore it. I opened the door and froze in the doorway. I had opened the door to a lavish suite, and I couldn't believe my eyes. Hope was standing against the wall as a middle-aged man approached her. He scrutinized the teenager as if he were trying to determine if he would purchase a painting. A firm arm wrapped around me and the door suddenly closed in my face, trapping Hope's screams inside. I struggled against the hold, but couldn't escape. Let me go! I shrieked, my fear nearly clogging my throat. The guy who tried to prevent me from intervening on Hope's behalf sighed before lifting me up and tossing me over his shoulder. I wanted to scream, but was fearful of making things worse for myself. He ran down the hallway, his shoulder digging into my stomach. By the time he stopped walking, I felt like I would expel the pizza I had just consumed. He entered a room that smelled of lavender, and when the door slammed shut, he lifted me from his shoulder and tossed me onto the king-size bed. I immediately sat up, taking in deep breaths. The light flooded the room, and I glanced up into the scowling face of a stranger. "'Are you stupid?' the man hissed in Nerth, his dark eyes hard. He didn't look like one of my siblings, though he did have tan skin and dark hair. But his hair was straight and silky, and had gold highlights. He was tall, and wore a red uniform of some kind. He had a weapons belt with unfamiliar gadgets hanging from it. "'You aren't related to me, are you?' I asked which made his jaw tick before a look of astonishment crossed his face. "'You have a language, Chip?' the man asked, confused. "'No. I learned Nert the old-fashioned way,' I responded. "'So you aren't related to me?' "'No. I'm currently one of Lord Shreve's knights. We boarded this ship an hour ago, so that Lord Shreve's can meet his bride,' he revealed. "'And who would that be?' I asked, confused." Your screaming sister. Who else? The stranger wanted to know, and my mouth popped open. He couldn't be serious. Hope was a teenager. Why would a man so old marry a teenager? I wondered. The man raked his hands through his hair. For one thing, Norethian women started dying out when the Jantons released a plague on our planet that specifically attacked females. So any woman Lord Shreve's age would either be barren or dead. Number two... Your father owed him a favor and announced that he had just the perfect bride for him, the stranger said, disgust on his face. Had Lord Shreves gotten a look at you, he would have preferred you. You're much prettier. His words were harsh, so it didn't sound like he was complimenting me. Okay. Um, Hope was screaming. I thought that something bad was happening to her, I defended. The man frowned and gently inspected my hands. Your fingers aren't like the fingers of the lazy noblewomen, he noted. I sew, cook, and do whatever I have to do for myself, I said, explaining the condition of the pads of my fingertips. 
Before I could even say a word, David walked through the wall and approached the bed. He looked relieved when he spotted us. Lord Larshak, I was looking for my sister, David said in Nerth. Take her, the Lord ordered. Keep her out of trouble. David nodded, and I stood, glad to be out of Lord Larshak's presence. He was making me uncomfortable. I happily took David's arm, and he led me through the door and hustled me past the room that held Hope and her new husband. Then, my brother took me to my room. He pulled me into a tight hug, which caught me by surprise. But I returned the embrace, glad that my brother was happy to see me. He pulled away and eyed me with sympathy in his gaze. Sorry. We had to grab you, Jade. It was either comply or watch as our mothers were tortured, David whispered in English. I nodded in understanding before rushing into the room. Chapter 13 Jade, Somewhere in Space Thank goodness! Don't ever do that again! Molly shouted. I collapsed on the closest bed, which was Nina's, and let out a breath. Guys, I found something else out, I said, my eyes landing on Faith, who was sitting up in her bed. Is my sister dead? She demanded. No, um, father married her off to Lord Treves, I blurted out. Is he ugly? Well, of course he is. That has to be why my sister screamed, Faith rambled. No, he's a... The door opened and Lady Valera barged in, followed by Gwen. Everyone frowned at her appearance, but Lady Valera didn't pay our confusion any mind. Look, let me make this short. Your father decided to breed with human trash in order to populate our house with females, she said in Nerth. Whether you marry an old disgusting lord or a decent one will depend on how you rank in his eyes. Lady Valera's eyes landed on me, and she sighed. I guess you aren't so bad, Jade. Nina, you have the perfect disposition for someone who enjoys the quiet life. But I'm unsure of you, Amy. You're boring, and I suppose that you're pretty enough. But I still think you need a little work. Molly, you have fire, which can be entertaining and desirable. But you, Faith, are an utter moron. To think that I'd actually let human scum attend to me? Hell, you were so stupid to believe that Karen was your friend. In fact, she chose a wonderful husband for your sister, Hope. Lord Shreves is old, cruel, and has a voracious appetite between the sheets. You I'll give to Bever Hendrick. He's a jeweler that I enjoy using. He was vacationing off-world and needs to travel to one of his mines, which is on another planet near Naretha, so he'll take you along with him, Lady Valera said, but no one understood her but my sister Gwen and me. My face fell, which made Nina frown. The lady waved and led Gwen out of the room. Well, my sister Faith questioned, what did the lady say? You are getting married to a jeweler tomorrow, I announced, before forcing myself to provide every detail of the conversation. Everyone aside from Faith seemed somewhat reassured by the lady's opinion of them, but Faith scowled at me. You're making it up, she accused. She's marrying me off to a wealthy jeweler because she likes me. I had the feeling that the jeweler was just as old and desperate as Lord Shreve's, but I didn't have a chance to say a word because the ever-so-helpful David waltzed out of our closet. Jade's right, Faith. Lady Valera can't stand you. You were just too stupid to see it, David confirmed, and my sister began to bawl. To no one's surprise, Nina was the one that went to comfort her. I was too focused on the thought that at any moment I could be married off to some random lord or businessman. I sighed and got to my feet and glanced into the shared closet. I spotted the blue dress that I had been working on. I pulled it out and decided to continue sewing. It was the only thing I could do, since the alternative was dreading my fate. I sewed until my hands begged me to stop. David was long gone by then. I changed into the nightgown that I hid under my pillow. Then I brushed my teeth, then covered myself with the blanket. Faith was fast asleep, with Nina sharing a bed with her. Molly was awake, sitting at the desk, working on her nerf. Amy was working on her sewing, which was steadily improving. I closed my eyes and counted backwards from a thousand. I didn't fall asleep until I made it to the six hundreds. A knock on the bedroom door caused my eyes to fly open. I sat up and let out a yawn. I spent the night tossing and turning. 
I walked over to the door, since the other girls had taken longer to wake up. I reluctantly opened the door and found Lex on the other side. I had never spoken to him before, but I had the impression that he didn't want to be on this ship any more than we did. His face soured when he saw me. The jeweler will be ready for his bride in an hour, he reported in Nerth. Understood, I responded, and surprise flashed across his face. I guess he really assumed that no one could learn Nerth without the implant. He nodded and walked away from me. I closed the door, then walked over to the bed holding my two sleeping sisters. I gently shook Faith, who had drifted back to sleep. She woke up and peered up at me. What is it? She asked. We have an hour to help you get ready. Take a shower, I ordered. Faith grudgingly followed my directions, grabbing some underclothes and heading to the bathroom. Who braided my hair while I was sleeping? I inquired. Nina sat up and raised her hand. I combed and braided your hair every day, she confessed. I quickly found the tablet and swiped through it and found a hairstyle and showed it to Nina. Can you do that? I questioned. What are you roping us into? Amy asked, a note of suspicion in her tone. We are going to make Faith look her very best to spite Lady Valera, and by making her look good, the jeweler won't ask for anyone else, I said, feeling horrible at the words. My sisters nodded in agreement as I pulled out the beautiful blue dress that I completed the night before. Damn, she gets that, Molly complained. We have to send her off in style, I said, agreeing with Molly's temperament. There is makeup in the vanity. I can do makeup and nails, Amy offered. Thanks, I said, eyeing Molly. Do I look like a girly girl to you? She challenged. No, I responded, shooting her a grin. When Faith exited in her underthings, Amy rushed in and came back with a nail kit. Instead of bottles of nail polish, there was a nail polish gun that would pour out whatever color you chose from a menu. While she worked, Nina combed, brushed, and braided Faith's hair into the updo. Then I unzipped the dress and helped her step into it. I zipped it up and Amy did her makeup. An hour later, the door flew open and Gwen stood there, dressed in one of her gowns. Faith stepped forward in a dress that rivaled my sister's. Gwen frowned upon seeing our sister. I made the gown, I announced, pride filling my chest. She nodded and led Faith away. For the record, I want an actual wedding dress, Molly blurted out. I thought that you aren't a girly girl, I teased. Molly shrugged. It doesn't mean that I don't want to look nice, she reasoned. My sister did have a point. We dressed and showered and made our way to breakfast. This time, we decided to eat the hard bread that the cook offered. None of us were hungry enough to bother cooking. We plopped down at our usual table, which was kind of empty. We were the last ones to come to breakfast, as usual. Our father marched over to us, a frown on his face. Bepper Hendrick's niece attended their wedding. She loved the gown that Faith wore and wanted one made just like that one, he said. Did you tell him that I made it? I asked. My father let out a sigh. Look, Jade, I tried everything. Even saying that you sewed it for your sister is a gift. She wants that dress, my father said. What are her measurements? I reluctantly inquired. So, you'll make the gown? My father wanted to know. What will happen if I don't? I asked, curious. He won't forgive a fourth of my debt, my father admitted. And what will you give me if I make the dress? I could sell Nina to a commoner, my father threatened. Won't work, since all of us want commoners, I lied. You'd be giving us what we want, a life removed from court. You would do well as a seamstress's apprentice. I could even see Amy surviving as a commoner. But what skills does Molly have? My father challenged. I sighed, glad that the Lord spoke in English. What's your name? I asked. What does that have to do with you making the dress? He demanded. Nothing. I just want to know. It's weird that you're my father and I don't even know your first or last name. I said. My name is Manor Peirk, he replied. Great. I said, thinking that I didn't much like the last name Peirk, but I'd let it go. So, will you make the dress? He asked, impatience brewing in his eyes. 
Only if you explain what kind of competition we'll compete in when we get to Naretha, I said. It's just a few harmless games. The winners are given lords, and the losers to a lowly commoner, my father revealed. What if I want a commoner? I challenged. You? Oh no, Jade. You won't be given to a commoner. His words gave me a bad feeling in my stomach. You will join Lord Rima's harem. Valera and I both agree that you're the most intelligent and beautiful of my daughters. I can't send Gwen because of her gift, and the others can be useful. So I don't get to be auctioned? I asked, my throat about to close up. No, my dear. You go to another harem, where my most trusted ally, Lord Rima, can keep you until he marries you off to some deserving knight, he explained, coldness filling his eyes. Let me stay with my sisters and I'll make the dress, I bargained, my heart racing. I was barely getting used to the harem I had been tossed into. I couldn't imagine going somewhere new. No can do. I already told Lord Rima that you were going to be gifted to him, he said. But I could compromise. Compromise? I asked uncertainly. If you don't make the dress, I send Nina to Lord Rima instead, he said, a smug expression on his face. I'll make the dress, I said, accepting that I had no leverage in this matter. As soon as Lord Petterk went back to his seat, Nina spoke. Thank you, she said. If you want, I can live with Lord Rima instead. No, I insisted. Ladies, I think we're missing something. Why not auction Jade off? Molly inquired. Because Jade is so much prettier than Karen. Even if she didn't score well, I'm sure that the wealthier gentleman would bid for her, Nina replied. I had the sense that a gift was far more valuable than looks, which meant that Gwen was probably the one to beat. I sighed and continued to eat, not wanting the food to go to waste. Who knew how Lord Rima would treat me? And what if he decided that he wanted to take me to bed? Could I refuse? I had to do more research about harems in Naretha. I needed to see if I could find any information on Lord Rima. I needed to continue sewing dresses for my sisters, in hopes that beautiful dresses would move auctioneers to bid on them. And the last thing I needed to do was see if we could access the gifts in our crystals. That would ensure that everyone in our group was matched well. Chapter 14 Sheena Earth Silversmith, Massachusetts Amber and I were promptly unenrolled from school. I sent Derek a text letting him know that Amber and I would be joining his merry little crew. He responded with a short, okay, and nothing more. One would think that Derek hadn't found his soulmate. He didn't initiate a conversation with me, despite the fact that he had been eager to be the point of contact for me. That thought pounded me until the morning of our departure. I walked down the stairs with a backpack on my shoulders. I packed clothing, toiletries, and dry food for the journey. Amber was waiting for me in the kitchen, a beautiful gold sword strapped to her waist. It wasn't enchanted, since we had no carvers in our coven, but it still packed a deadly punch. She smiled widely, excitement resting in her eyes. My mother was beside her, a sad expression on her face. She cleared her throat before speaking. I knew Sandy, the oracle that passed away years ago. She told me that I would raise an oracle who would forge a friendship with a carver. Together, they would save Earth, Mom said. Bullcrap, since Jade was as human as they came. But I wasn't about to tell my mother what my true feelings were. Great. Why didn't you mention this to Ben sooner? All he has been saying is that we really shouldn't leave, Amber complained. I held out my hand, and Amber tapped it. Before my mother could even speak, I was dragged into another vision. I was in an elegant dining room that had a small but beautiful chandelier hanging over the oval-shaped dining room table. The polished wood floors were covered with beautiful rose petals. Max Garcia walked into the room, carrying a champagne bucket. He eyed the area, a small smile on his face. He placed the bucket on the table and tilted his head. He seemed startled by something. I couldn't see what for a moment. But then, a tall, thin man strolled into the room his olive skin free of all blemishes. He wore a strange-looking silk suit complete with a tie. Fear filled Max's eyes as he eyed him. "'Lord Perk,' Max whispered, quickly snatching the bottle out of the bucket. 
Lord Petrick eyed the place with disdain. He didn't seem like a Najori, since he hadn't teleported into the room, but I didn't think that he was a royal from Earth, either. Max, what a charming little setup you have here, the Lord said, as a broad teenager with cropped dark hair and caramel skin joined the two men. He had a sword strapped to his waist, the black weapon making Max sigh. Rose said that you gave her permission to marry me, Max said. I did. For a price, though that part should have been understood, Lord Petrick said. Max frowned. What do I have to give you in order to keep Rose? Max hesitantly inquired. That daughter of yours. What's her name? Amber? Max's eyes widened in shock. What do you want with her? Amber's father demanded. I want to add her to my harem. It's a fair trade since you stole Rose from me. Lord Petrick coldly reasoned. She's a bit young, but I can wait until she's of age. No, Max said. As much as I love Rose, I could never do that to my princess. Lord Petrick let out a sigh. Well, divorce isn't an option, Max. You know about me and my operation here. Let me make this clear to you. Either you agree to give me Amber, or you die, the Lord threatened. Kill me now, because you will never get your hands on my girl, Max said. Lord Petrick laughed. One way or another, Amber Garcia will be a part of my harem, the evil lord declared. Lex, do the honors. Lex unsheathed his sword, strutted forward, and beheaded Max Garcia without a thought. Then, Lord Petrick left the room, leaving the teenager alone with the dead man. Lex's eyes were momentarily wide with horror. But then he shook his head and wiped his blade on Max's shirt. Lord Petrick whistled as he returned, carrying a beautiful silver platter. This is where I want the head, the Lord ordered. Anastasia, David, come in here. Moments later, two finely dressed teenagers entered the room. Anastasia's eyes widened at the body. I take it he said no? she asked, appearing horrified. Obviously. Why else would his head be on the floor? Lex snapped. Anastasia, Dad wants the man's head on the platter, and I don't want to get my clothes dirty. Anastasia lifted her hand, and the head floated into the air and dropped on the platter face up, with a thud. Perfect. I think we should bury the body in the backyard. Lord Petrick suggested. David sighed and grabbed Anastasia's hand. The body floated into the air and zipped toward David, who reached out and grabbed one of Max's ankles. Moments later, the pair headed toward the wall, then walked right through it. Lex let out a bored sigh. Are you really going to take Amber? He wondered. Not yet. I keep my word. I'll add her to my harem once she's in her early twenties. Until then, I'll send her nice postcards so that she doesn't look for Max, Lord Petrick decided. That's how I'll keep track of her. But you'll be in space, Lex argued. I do have associates, Lex. Don't question me, unless you want to end up like Max. Remember, Lex, you don't have a gift, the Lord taunted. Lex's jaw tightened for a moment before he relaxed. You're right. Sorry, sir, Lex responded. No problem. I guess I'll be seeing your mother tonight, the Lord said before I was shoved back into my body. Tears began spilling down my face as soon as I registered what I saw. Max, the kind-hearted man that used to surprise me with ice cream when I was a kid, was dead. I had held a bit of resentment toward him since he abandoned Amber two years ago, but he hadn't. The man had been dead the whole time. Arms wrapped around me, and I mentally noted that the grip belonged to Amber. I held her close, not wanting to tell her what I saw. I held her as I looked at my mother, who frowned. The Narethians killed your father, Amber. I'm so sorry, I softly told her. Amber pulled back from me and blinked in surprise. How? Amber said as my mother handed me a napkin to wipe my face. I recounted the story from the beginning, leaving nothing out. My mother let out a sigh. Head on the platter? Amber slowly asked. And these brats all had gifts? 
most of them, except for the one that swung the sword, I said, as Angelo teleported into the room. He seemed hesitant and worried. Is everything all right? He asked as Derek appeared. Derek's eyes landed on me, and I saw the concern brimming in them. The Nerethians killed my father. Let's get this show on the road. Or in space. Whatever. Amber sneered. Amber, you don't have to come, I gently said. I do. There is no way I'm leaving Jade with those people, she insisted. Julia nodded. Remember what I told you, Sheena, my mother reminded me. I nodded and reluctantly walked over to Angelo and took one of his hands. Amber grabbed the other, and I felt that horrible burning light again. Chapter 15 Sheena, Somewhere in Space We appeared in a luxurious bedroom that had a king-size bed, a dresser, a nightstand, and a closet. There were four black boxes mounted on the ceiling, one in each corner of the room. Welcome to Winston's ship. Amber, I can take you to your room, Angelo offered. Nope. I'll stay here with Sheena, Amber insisted. Want a tour? Angelo wondered. I need to see every inch of this vessel, Amber said, her eyes losing their playful light. I wasn't sure if Amber was taking this mission seriously because she was trying to block out the pain of losing her dad, or because she wanted to protect me. In any case, she placed her backpack on top of the dresser and strolled to the door. I dropped my pack beside hers and followed. Derek, Winston, Mira, and I are going on this trip with you. But I will teleport out of here if Kira needs me, Angelo warned as we stepped into the hallway that had five doors on each side. Each bedroom has an attached bathroom, Angelo said as he gestured to the stairs that led to the next level. We climbed up and the open area graced my eyes. There was a section that held two rows of recliners, each row holding six recliners. Winston sat in the pilot's chair, with Derek sitting beside him. Alongside the seated area was a kitchen complete with a kitchen table, a clear fridge, and a stove and a sink. Hungry? Angelo asked, excitement in his eyes. I am, Amber said with enthusiasm. The promise of food momentarily brought out her personality. I needed to talk to her about the second thing revealed in the vision. She seemed too nonchalant about a creep wanting her for his harem. I couldn't shake that it may have been a bad idea to involve her. But what could I do? Celeste had been the one who assigned Amber to the mission. Okay then, Angelo said. It will take us a month to arrive on Naretha. If we need to, I can always teleport back to Earth to grab more supplies. But we would have to dock on a spaceport for me to do that, Angelo warned. So let me get this straight. If you wanted, you could teleport to Naretha? Amber asked, shock and awe competing for projection in her voice. Angelo nodded. All Nidorians have that ability, but most of our kind can't take others with us. Amber appeared disappointed. Of course you can't. That would just make things too easy. Amber complained. So, do any of you know about a Lord Perk? And here it was. Amber would avenge Max, and I wanted to as well. But we needed to find Jade first. If killing Lord Perk would risk my best friend's life, I wouldn't go for it. Before I could express my worries, I was shoved into another vision of the past. An eight-foot-tall man with waist-length, long, light brown hair stood in a throne room. The imposing throne appeared as if it were braided together with iron-gray metal. Though the seat was cushioned, it was doubtful that it was comfortable. The giant frowned as a tall, slender woman who was a foot shorter than the man rushed into the room, garbed in armor that was complete with a breastplate. The man tilted his head, exposing his neck, and the woman smiled broadly as if the gesture of respect thrilled her. Her hair was red, and it hung to her waist in a French braid. "'Do you think that the king will actually send his firstborn to marry me?' The woman asked, her green eyes twinkling. The man with the light brown hair glared at the woman. "'King? Shala, I told you that he was dethroned and had seven years to hand the kingdom over to me,' the man protested, which made the woman roll her eyes. "'And tell me, great Emperor Tolda,' 
What makes you believe that the proud king will comply in seven years? Shala demanded. You know the rules, Shala. It's either obey or be destroyed, he warned. My ancestors have sent the mighty asteroid into a planet before. Shala frowned down at her scarred hands, not looking pleased by the prospect of destroying a planet. Just hope that the foolish king obeys and sends Zemire here, she said. Sister, you're a princess of the Janton Empire. Stop being so weak. We are a warrior. Shala launched herself at her brother and had him flat on his back. She swiftly held her blade to his throat. Watch it, brother. I could decapitate you and become empress, she threatened. The emperor tried to move, but he only succeeded in nicking his skin on Shala's blade. Let me up, he ordered, his eyes growing dark with hatred. Promise that you won't be foolish enough in following in Edgar the Psycho's footsteps, she fired back. The Najorians were stupid not to yield. They were teleporting cockroaches. They deserved what they got, Tulta sneered. Really? And our race has benefited from destroying that world? There were riches, healing waters, food sources that we could have benefited from, Shala shouted. You will not bring shame on our dynasty, brother. You can destroy a section of the planet as a warning, but not the whole thing. Shala, you don't give me orders, the emperor screamed. If that king doesn't yield, Noretha will be destroyed. Holy crap, I cried, disbelieving of what I witnessed. Derek stood in front of me, his green eyes meeting mine. His lips twisted in a frown as he continued staring. It took a minute for me to realize that the guy was reading my mind. He stepped back and shook his head, some of the dark strands falling on his forehead. I instinctively brushed his hair away from his face, then felt stupid for doing so. Did you see Lord Peric's death? Amber asked hopefully. Derek shook his head, which confused me. I was one to always spat out my visions. But then his eyes fell on Winston, who was still in his seat. Oh, so he didn't want the pilot knowing of how his home planet was destroyed. I eyed Amber, and he nodded. Derek, come tour my room. It's brilliant, I said, a wide grin on my face. Why? Angelo is going to make food. Amber complained. And besides, Derek has seen it before. Amber apparently didn't know how to take a hint. Derek doesn't want me knowing what your oracle saw, Winston said. Despite the fact that I'm doing him a favor, I'm still not trustworthy, and neither is Paint Boy over there. His name is Angelo, I defended, which made Angelo shake his head. Winston has a reason to be pissed. We are all risking our lives to go on this mission. I think that everyone needs to be included. Amber chimed in. I had a feeling that Derek had his reasons for not saying a word. If this gets out, we could find ourselves in a war, Derek warned. Does it have anything to do with rescuing Jade? Amber demanded. Sort of, Mira said as she sauntered into the room. She was wearing a pair of jeans and a tank top, and her feet were clad in high-heeled sandals that had straps that wrapped around her ankles. Then tell us, Amber insisted, because a time limit is just what we needed. Mira, Derek pleaded, this is classified information. We need to stop at a spaceport so I can teleport back to Earth to tell the king. That serious? Amber asked. Very. Mira agreed. There is a spaceport a week away, Winston offered. But it isn't my favorite to go to. They sell unusual creatures there. If any humans are sold there, we're buying them, Amber said. I read enough books to understand what unusual creatures are. Will do, Winston replied. Derek frowned. Don't make any moves until I speak to King Rayon. Derek said as he eyed me. You have my mate with you. Good enough to transport and protect your mate, but not good enough to hear about a vision, was Winston's sharp reply. Judging by the worry flickering in Derek's eyes, 
I sensed that this discovery was bigger than what I thought it was. So what? The Janton crushed a planet with an asteroid in the past? It sounded like some terrible emperor was to blame and he was long dead. Derek shook his head. I was obviously missing something big. But what in the hell was it? Since we're stopping at a port in a week, can I check on Kira? Angelo asked, his eyes lighting up. What is your obsession with her? Winston laughed. You do know that guarding the half-breed was a joke of an assignment. No sense in taking it seriously. Angelo teleported to the front and hit a button, which made a beep sound in the air. He then dragged Winston out of the pilot's chair and tossed him on the ground. You can call me whatever you want. That's fine. But you will never call Kira a half-breed. Got it? He snarled. Winston sat up and slowly got to his feet. Whatever, man, he said. I wasn't surprised when Angelo teleported away. Chapter 16 Sheena, Somewhere in Space There goes lunch, Amber groaned. Nice work, Winston. Anyone going after him? I asked a minute after Angelo vanished. Mira let out a sigh. Angelo doesn't want to be bothered. He didn't want to assist you, Mira confirmed. He wanted to stay in Silversmith with the half-breed. Hey, Amber protested. The half-breed has a name. And if she were here and heard that, Kira would punch your lights out. I chuckled, knowing that Kira Parker had quite a temper. Mira's doubtful expression made Amber shoot Mira a sympathetic expression. She will learn that Kira isn't someone to screw around with, Amber said, before heading to the kitchen. I followed her, since I hardly wanted to interact with strange aliens that I barely knew. The things I do for you, Jade, I thought to myself. To my surprise and discomfort, Derek joined us. Amber opened the freezer and fished out a couple of pounds of ground beef. I already knew what my friend was going to make, so I entered the pantry and selected a couple of boxes of spaghetti, a large bottle of tomato sauce, and some Kraft cheese and dumped it on the counter. Amber grinned at me as she began cooking. I leaned against the wall, Derek deciding to take up a spot beside me. I wanted to fight, unsure of the pull that I felt to touch him. I wasn't typically shy about flirting with men, which often got me in trouble. But I hadn't decided if I was keeping Derek, so didn't want to make a move yet. You don't know if you're keeping me? Derek asked, in a tone that told me that he wasn't pleased by that notion. I just met you, and you spent an entire week ignoring me, so yeah, I'm not sure if I want to start something with you yet, I reasoned. His impatient expression caused annoyance to fill me. That was the very expression that Julia gave me when I expressed my doubts of wanting to ascend. I could already hear her voice now. Sheena, you don't have a choice in the matter. You were born a caster, and you'll die a caster. I would oftentimes smother my urge to tell the woman to stuff it. I would decide if I wanted to stick my neck out for the human race. It was a commitment that made me uncomfortable. It wasn't like I wanted to go rogue and commit evil crimes. But who said that I wanted to follow Celeste, a grumpy old coven leader? Why did I have to join a coven? I could go solo. Like my mother... Derek probably thought that everything had already been written. I was his and should accept no effort from him. That was never going to happen. Do you know how rare finding your soulmate is? Derek demanded. As rare as it is to be an oracle that's still breathing? I asked as Amber turned to us, surprise on her face. Angela wasn't lying. This stove is fast, she commented. Yeah, no kidding, I said eyeing the pasta that now rested in a serving dish. The sauce and meat were still simmering on the stove. Sheena, look. Derek, what is it that you want from me? I asked, shooting him a hard glare. Do you want me to fall into your arms, declare that I'm thrilled to find a mate and marry you? Yeah, that's not going to happen, unless you put in a little bit of effort. I am putting in effort. I'm in space, Risking my life to rescue a girl I don't even know just to make you happy. Derek argued, which was annoying. Jade was worth saving. She was kind, 
patient, generous, and an all-around awesome sister. We had plans to dorm together in college. She wasn't simply a shallow version of a friend. She saved me once, and I'd never forget it. Just remember this, jerk-off. If it wasn't for Jade, I wouldn't be alive. I owe her my life, I said, before storming out of the kitchen. I had enough of the entitled alien that assumed that I belonged to him. I walked past the sitting room and went straight for the bedrooms. A door to my left opened, and Angelo poked his head out. He sniffed the air, and a guilty expression flashed across his face. I offered lunch and stormed off before I could make it, he commented. Don't worry about it, I told him. Kira isn't just a half-breed, she's a person. I wanted to add in, just like Jade. I wanted to add in, just like Jade, but didn't feel like it was necessary. Angelo hadn't been the one that made it seem that she was a nobody. I instinctively lifted my shirt and caressed the scar that stretched across half of my stomach. My eyes filled as I recalled the sacrifice that Jade had willingly made. The Stevens were her guardians at the time, and signed all of the necessary paperwork. We had gone through the recovery together, something that bonded us beyond what anything else could. I had one of Jade's organs inside of me. I had the girl's kidney, and she had offered it to me without hesitation. I would do anything to save her from the Narethians. Want to talk about it? Angelo asked as his warm eyes landed on my scar. I quickly dropped my shirt and sucked in a breath. Jade saved my life. I get that you don't want to be here, and I'm sorry that you're away from Kira, but Jade... A tear trickled down my face, and I brushed it away. Sorry. I just hope that we aren't too late. All we can really do is try our best. And to make it clear, I do want to help you, Angelo said. I just don't like leaving Kira alone. I laughed. She'll be more than capable of protecting herself. Believe me, I assured. Angelo nodded, a fond smile slipping across his face. He was obviously thinking of a memory that made him chuckle. She keyed this jock's car for cheating on her. Then, when he had the nerve to ask Kira to pay for the damages, she kneed him then punched him in the nose. The fight was all over with before I could step in, he recalled. I felt terrible for Angelo, who was obviously enamored by the person that he was sent to protect. And I also felt guilty that I hadn't made an effort to become Kira's friend. Where does she think you went? I questioned. I told Tormund to tell her that I transferred schools. We don't know how long this could take, Angelo said. No goodbye? I asked. Angelo frowned. Kira was already mad at me. I didn't want to show up at her door, Angelo said. Don't be like Derek, I warned Angelo. Call the woman when we dock. Angelo nodded. I plan on checking on her. If all goes well, I can say goodbye then, he assured me. Or she'll slap you for disappearing, I teased, having a feeling that Kira cared deeply for Angelo. I wasn't sure what gave me the idea. Maybe it was instinct. I hadn't paid much attention to Kira, since she was a grade below me, and I had been distracted by the caster crap. But something told me that as I stood with Angelo, she was somewhere trying to accept not seeing him again. Guys! Food! Amber screeched. Upon hearing her voice, worry and uncertainty warred within me. I was positive that Amber was shoving her emotions down, or pretending to be happy. What if she had to choose between saving Jade and killing Lord Peirk? I had no idea what my friend would do. Here was a better question. What were we supposed to do about the people that murdered Jade's parents? Tim and Jane were kind people, and I was positive that they wanted to adopt Jade. You should probably eat, Angelo encouraged. I know that we have a lot of problems to solve, but dwelling on them won't help. I nodded and made my way over to the kitchen table. Derek gestured to the chair beside him. What the hell? Did he think I was someone that was going to be ordered around? Is that an order or an invitation? I asked. I'm sorry, Derek said, which made Winston laugh. Amber, who was seated on Derek's other side, rolled her eyes as she dug into her food. I eyed my already-made plate and sighed. Fine, 
I grumbled as Angela went to the kitchen. I plopped down beside Derek and began shoveling food in my mouth. My plan was to eat and run. I wasn't going to make anything easy for Derek. Chapter 17 Gwen, the Kegor Port Karen and I linked arms as soon as our feet hit the concrete. I peered up at the steel overhang that shielded us. There were twenty transports lining the drop-off point. Father's spaceship required a refuel, so it was hovering on the other side of the spaceport. Karen eyed the entrance of the mercantile section with hungry eyes. The mercantile was where space travelers could purchase supplies, equipment, and entertainment. I'm buying more fabric, Karen insisted as Lex, David, Lena, and Anastasia exited the flyer. Anastasia hustled over to us, her eyes lit with wonder. Ladies, let's go, she urged. Lena appeared less eager. She sent a nasty look in my direction, but I didn't let it bother me. We both knew that Father always found a way to get what he wanted. If I had refused, then Karen would have been ordered to assist David. The image of Jane and Tim's fiery grave popped into my head. I buried the memory in the same area where I submerged the memory of finding Max's head on the platter. I wasn't going to think about that. As long as my mother and I were alive, everything was fine. Gwen, didn't you hear me? Anastasia whined. Are you going to go with the guys to check out the unusual creatures, or shop for dresses with us? We should probably stick together, I suggested, which made Lex roll his eyes. Is that what Dad told you to do? Lex mocked. Obviously, Anastasia replied. Gwen always does what Dad says, and she's lucky for it. She gets the least number of punishments, Anastasia complained, as if I had any control over the matter. If she hated the light punishments, then Anastasia could behave. Guys, we can't stand here forever, David pointed out. Let's just do both. Fine, Lex agreed. Of course he always listened to the opinion of a man over whatever a woman said, even if said female expressed the same thought. I shoved down my anger, confident that I would get some form of revenge against him. Karen, Anastasia, and I needed to come up with a plan, pronto. Let's just see the unusual creatures first, Karen said. If we get that out of the way, we can shop. Or you could do option number three, a cool voice said. I wasn't surprised that Father decided to crash what was supposed to be an adventure meant for the six of us. I spun to face him and was horrified to see my mother by his side. She wore a fitted black dress with a plunging neckline. Her dark eyes were empty of all emotion, which was a clear indicator that my father's physician had drugged her. I wanted to snatch her up and make a run for the flyer. The fact that Lady Peirk wasn't with my father didn't bode well for my mother. I knew better than to sift through father's mind, since he could detect me. All I could do was wait and hope that mother did whatever he wanted. My breathing hitched when my mother began to sway on her feet. Mom, are you all right? I inquired. Gwen, Rose will be fine. She had a minor procedure, father announced. All my siblings suddenly grew nervous, well, except for Lena. She appeared bored, like she already knew the outcome to this situation. Had I actually believed that father confided in her, I would have entered her mind. All right, kids. Your father is going to gamble with a few wealthy people, the twisted lord explained. I was too worried about my mother to care about our afternoon being interrupted. Need me to read the minds of the other players? I mentally asked my father. Exactly, father responded. Seriously? Lex complained. We earned our free time. An arched brow told me that Lex was going to receive a light punishment. Karen must have noted that as well, because she placed a hand on our brother's arm. It's okay, Lex. Dad will reward us if we obey him, Karen softly told him. Follow me, children my father said, before pulling a leash out of the pocket of his silk suit and connecting an end to a ring on my mother's dress. He held the other end and walked over to the automatic doors. 
Lex and David followed my parents, and Karen was next to step inside the building. Anastasia glanced at me, her worried eyes making my stomach twist. It will be fine, Gwen, she told me. Dad probably wants us to be his bodyguards. Her assumption seemed likely, but what was my mother doing here? Instead of debating it, I linked arms with Anastasia and we walked into the building. The store was to the left, a restaurant was to our right, and a bank of elevators were in front of us. Father walked over to the elevator to the left and waved his hand over a sensor that was beside the door. The door opened and we piled into the lift. When the doors closed, my eyes landed on my mother, who was leaning against the wall. She wasn't my father's favorite, so why bring her? Maybe she was motivation? I was his obedient daughter, the one who always completed even the lowest of tasks for him. Why did father find it necessary to drag a sedated person to the spaceport? The doors opened and father waltzed out of the elevator, my mother stumbling behind him. We stepped out into a wide hallway with doors on either side. My father strode to room 327 and waved his hand in front of the palm sensor. Moments later, the door swung open, the laughter of boisterous men traveling into the hallway. Great! I would have to enter the heads of drunk men. I made eye contact with Anastasia, who looked put out. If a drunk man thinks to put his hands on me, I'll toss him against the wall, she hissed. I nodded, and we entered the room. Arnett! The Lord brought his bastards and his concubine with him! A man that had to be eight feet tall cheered. He sat at a table that was at least five feet tall, in a plush chair. His companion was equally as tall, and looked similar, but had shoulder-length brown hair. Artel! Lord Peirk is a man of his word, he said, eyeing my mother with a grin. Sit on the couches, my father ordered, before tossing the leash to Lex. He hopped up into the large chair across from Arnett. We all headed for one of the two supersized couches leaning against the wall. Lex harshly handled my mother, tossing her onto the couch. Hey, pup, don't damage the merchandise, Arnett shouted. Karen and Anastasia both glanced at me, their worried gazes making me panic. Did my father think to offer up my mother to the winner? Fury briefly consumed me. But then I took deep breaths, not wanting to let my emotions distract me. I sat beside Mom. It concerned me that she could barely keep her eyes open. Karen sat beside me, her expression lacking the concern that was usually there. Instead, she seemed fascinated by the scene that was unfolding. The game is simple, my father mentally told me. A person declares that they have a certain card. If you believe him, you don't challenge. If you don't believe him, you challenge. If you win the challenge, they have to draw from the deck on the table. Before you ask, some people have to lie because you can only play even numbers. This was a simple game of the galactic version of BS. I could help my father win the game. Let's get started, Artel said right before taking a sip from a massive mug. Artel shuffled and handed out the cards. It took very little time for the game to start. I have a four, Artel announced. It took little effort for me to slip into his mind and confirm that he was telling the truth. He's telling the truth, I mentally told my father. For the first few rounds, all was well. I didn't catch someone in a lie until Artel spoke. I have a ten, he reported. He's lying, I mentally said to my father. He has a three. I'd like to challenge that, my father smugly said. Artel cursed and dramatically revealed his card. Collect three cards, brother, Arnett laughed. Artel scowled but did as he was told. To my horror, the game progressed at a rapid pace. I jumped between minds, my forehead aching from the strain. Sweat began dripping from my back as I sifted through the surface thoughts of drunk men. My sheer desperation was getting me through. At one point, I felt liquid dripping from my nose. Gwen, you're bleeding! Anastasia gasped. But I kept on going, determined not to fail. Artel cursed. You won, my lord. No need for your pet to give away any more of our hands. We believe you. 
Confusion swam in my gut. What in the hell was the giant talking about? Everyone on the couch aside from my mom were equally confused. What did Dad gain by revealing my powers? What kind of game was he playing? You couldn't handle your defeat? My father, who only had a couple of cards in his hand, demanded. The two giants had too many cards to risk challenging my father. Indeed. Gwen is a talented woman. Arnett agreed as he got to his feet. I blinked in surprise when he headed toward the couch. Perhaps the giant wanted to shake my hand. Dad would never let him harm me. He reached Lex and studied the leash. Expand the leash before you hand it to me, pup, Arnett ordered. Lex complied, which was startling. Why did the giant want my mother's leash? As soon as Arnett had the leash in his grip, he smiled at my mother. Come, my dear Rose. Wait, father said, which made my heart leap. He was going to challenge this man's actions. I stood, ready to help in any way I could. Not that I'd have a chance against a giant. You have the proof that Rose can bear a gifted offspring, Dad boasted. Now give me my son. Artel, Arnett said. The other giant tapped his ear and muttered something. Moments later, the door opened and a well-dressed man with black hair and olive skin walked into the room. My father's eyes filled with delight as his eyes rested on him. This is my heir, Obi, my father declared, a wide grin on his face. Obi eyed us in confusion. I finally spoke up. Dad, what does Arnett want with Mom? I asked, my voice steady. Well, Arnett began. Your brother Obi was caught in my region, so I captured him. Your father came up with quite the bargain. You see, I have a problem finding a wife that's submissive. The Jantons are a warrior race, and many warrior women don't see me as a fit mate. I need a powerful heir to restore my family's honor. Your father said that I could use one of his concubine's wombs if I return his son. I told him that humans were inferior, their race not even strong enough to bear a Janton. That's when he told me of the humans being able to bear gifted children. I didn't believe him and wanted a demonstration. You proved that you could read minds quite well. I had one of his doctors plant my seed in her womb just in case the deal went through. So it looks like I get what I wanted, Arnett bragged. Nausea began to fill me when I realized that I had lost. Mother wouldn't have been forced to bear another's child. The dead look in her eyes wasn't there because she was drugged. She was miserable. I couldn't let this happen. I had to stop that monster from taking my mother. I stepped forward, but was frozen by an invisible force. Anastasia shook her head, but I wasn't giving up so easily. I slipped into Arnett's mind, my will grasping his. I concentrated on forcing a thought into his mind. Arnett's unfocused expression must have given me away, because my father roared my brother's name. Lex! Moments later, I felt sharp pain explode in my skull. The second blow knocked me out like a light. Chapter 18 Gwen, Somewhere in Space Cold slammed into my body, making it difficult to breathe. I slowly cracked open my eyes and let out a groan. I was lying on a metal slab in the punishment room. I was going to suffer for what I attempted to do to the giant. This was going to hurt, that was for sure. But nothing hurt more than the sense of failure that I felt. It broke me, thinking of my fragile mother being in the hands of a Janton, a member of a race that had poisoned another race into near extinction. She must have been petrified. A cool tear trickled out of my eye and splashed against my cheek. I was convinced that the room was so cold that my tears could turn to frost. When was the punishment coming? I remembered Anastasia telling me that waiting for the punishment was far worse than the actual punishment. Now that I was lying on the table, I could understand what she was talking about. I didn't dare to move, knowing that if I attempted to escape, the pain would be more intense. It wasn't like I wanted to move anyway. I'd lost the one person that I was desperate to protect. My mother was gone, and now my survival didn't matter so much. 
My siblings stood by and watched as my mother was traded for the life of a brother that none of us had any attachment to. We could have done something had we worked together. For the first time, a thought lingered in my mind. Jade would never have sat there and watched as a woman was brutalized for a second time. Another horrible thought also occurred to me. My father could undo what made my mother infertile. She had yearned to give Max a child. Max. Max was a good father, someone who loved both Amber and I, and father took him from us. Before I could contemplate the matter of Max's death more, the punishment lights began raining down on me. The pain was nothing like I'd felt before. It felt like bullets were being shot into my body. I screamed as my vision began blurring. It felt like the agony would go on for an eternity. To my utter horror, the pain intensified to the point where I couldn't take any more. I wanted to escape so badly that I pleaded with my body to give out. All I wanted was for the pain to stop. It needed to stop. It had to stop. Something snapped in my stomach, uncoiling like a viper waiting to strike. My entire body was filled with energy. I felt the pressure building in my gut, to the point that it burned so bad. I had to release whatever was inside of me. Suddenly, my vision cleared, and it took me a moment to realize that the pain had ended. I blinked, surprised that the entire room was bathed in a bright light. Moments later, I sat up and peered down at my body, which was glowing. What the hell? I aimed my palms at the punishment light, and a bolt slammed into it, making the lights blink out. My body dimmed, and I took in deep breaths. So I was more gifted than I had expected. But that light made absolutely no sense. It wasn't like I could actually go to Father. He would only repeat my punishment over again. And, wait a second... That monster was not my father. If he loved me, he would never have taken Mom from me. He had no soul. He was going to pay. I wasn't sure how, but I was positive that I could figure out something. Forget making Lex pay. He was small pickings. But Lord Peirk sold my mother to the enemy. I would most likely never see her again. That thought nearly stopped my heart. Mom... When I was released, I'd go back to my suite, and she would no longer be there. Suddenly, staying in the punishment room seemed like the more appealing of the two fates. I didn't want another reminder of how I wasn't strong enough. But before I could avoid my failure, the door opened and Lex walked in, his expression of boredom turning to surprise when his eyes landed on me. Gwen, you're one tough chick. How in the hell are you still awake? Lex asked. I rolled my eyes and slowly stepped down from the table. My legs were much steadier than I expected. I gave Lex the evil eye. You'll pay for this, Lex, I warned. You'll pay for what you did. Lex shrugged, unconcerned by my threat. He didn't have to believe me. In fact, it would suit me if he forgot all about my threat. That would make things simple for me. Lex wouldn't believe that a woman could be his doom. I was annoyed that Lex whistled as he led me down the hallway. He waved at everyone, as if the crew of the ship were his homeboys. As soon as I entered my room, Lex shut the door behind me. I eyed Lena, who sat on my mother's bed. Obi needed a place to stay, so I was booted from my room, my half-sister explained. Then she closed her eyes and fell asleep. I glanced at the clock and groaned. Dinner was in less than two hours, and I was required to attend. Waiting for an invitation? Lena asked as she opened the door. I sluggishly made it to my feet. The red gown that I wore felt like it was made out of lead. My entire body pleaded for me to rest. But I had to put on a show, lest my father stuff me in a punishment room again. I would defy my father by being nearly the last person to enter the room. But I wouldn't push my luck. Father is sending Jade to Lord Rima. She'll become a member of his harem. I reported. Lena's expression hardened, making me think that she knew of the Lord's reputation. Are you telling me this to hurt me? My sister challenged. No, I responded. Just keep it to yourself. I'm sure that Father will announce the news when he's ready. 
So the information is a peace offering, then? Lena demanded. And tell me, Gwen, what do you think that this is going to do? Absolve you of guilt? You could have told Father that Jade died. You could have said that Jade's family went on vacation. We both know that you could have made everyone believe the lie. Her dark eyes met mine, and a chill ran through me. Did Lena know my secret? How could that be? Maybe she pieced things together? I didn't have time to ask Lena, because she spun on her heel and stormed out of the room. As I walked down the hallway, I had to grapple with one fact. I could have made everyone believe that Jade had left the country, but I had been afraid of risking Mom's life. In the end, she was in the hands of the Janton, and I was stuck on Lord Peirk's prized ship. There was no getting out of this hellish life that I had no control over. My heart pounding, I forced myself to walk to dinner. My eyes landed on Jade, who was dressed in a beautiful emerald day dress that had a slight shimmer to it. The other sisters at the reject table were all dressed in stunning masterpieces that Anastasia was bound to be jealous of. I thought of Jade and her fate, and felt somewhat responsible. If I had wanted to change Father's mind, I could have. I could make it so that he would never know. But I had been a coward hiding behind the excuse that I was keeping Mom alive. I walked over to the table and sat beside Anastasia, who was eyeing Karen with annoyance. "'What's up?' I asked, ignoring the empty chair to my left. "'Karen knew what was going to happen to your mother. Meg was the one that chose the woman that should get impregnated, and the traitor didn't warn us.' I was still pissed at Anastasia for using her telekinesis on me, but what could I have physically done to a bunch of giants anyway? Maybe she really was trying to protect me. I see, I whispered, Lena's words coming back to me. Be nice to my sister. Earn her trust. Then tell her what Lex did when the time is right. In that moment in time, Lena's words seemed hopeless. Jade was no more than a reject who enjoyed doing housework. But was there a power lurking inside of her? After all, hadn't I found a way to destroy the punishment light? Instinct told me to keep my mouth shut in regard to the deadly light. It was unnatural, something that hadn't been documented before. Gwen, I know that you're mad at me, but... I'm not mad at you, I said, rushing to assure Anastasia. She may have been vapid and shallow, but my sister meant well. Lena glanced in my direction and nodded as if she were agreeing with my assessment of Anastasia. "'I still don't think that Father is making the right decision about David being a knight,' Lex suddenly shouted. "'I'm a warrior!' "'You're a bully who likes to beat up women,' Lena sneered. "'Now shut up and eat!' I blinked in surprise at the platters of food that I hadn't noticed. The loss of my mother was making me feel off-kilter. "'Lena!' You should remember that Nerethian women are seen, not heard. My father coldly reprimanded. Just to piss father off, I slipped into his mind and planted a suggestion there. His eyes momentarily glazed over, but he straightened right away. Lex, you don't like your position? My father coolly demanded, which made Lena arch a brow. The topic changed threw her off. I selected a piece of bread some cheese, and a chunk of meat. After punishments, most of my siblings were too upset to gorge themselves on food. I decided that I would act the same, though I was ravenous. Using the strange power gave me extreme hunger pangs. Father, I'm not a scholar. I'm all muscle, Lex boasted. All muscle, huh? My father asked, a sly grin on his face. That should have been Lex's warning not to speak but he admitted it himself. Reasoning wasn't in his toolbox of skills. Father, David shouldn't be sent to the military. I should be, Lex argued. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Yes, Lex, you're so obedient. I asked you to be obedient, and you're questioning me in front of everyone? What a wonderful display of obedience. Lex frowned, and then he stiffened. Dad, I... Lucy, I want to spend some time with you tonight, my father said, which made Lex's jaw tick. He stood, his hand forming into a fist. 
My father ignored his aggressive act because I would have warned him if he were in danger. I pretended to be absorbed with my bread, my excuse for not telling the man what was going to happen. You son of a... Lex roared before slamming his fist in my father's nose. Anastasia squealed and raised a hand, stopping Lex from moving. Blood oozed from my father's broken nose. Blood splashed on his white silk suit. Tears ran down Lucy's face as she eyed her angry son. Father's eyes fell on me, his gaze hard. Gwen, tell Lex to attack his mother, he mentally demanded of me. Here, I mentally wondered, my eyes wide. No. He'll deliver the punishment in the punishment room, he mentally said, which made me feel guilty. I had wanted Lex to suffer, not Lucy. Okay, I said, my voice hollow. I used my mental gifts to calm Lex. As soon as the anger leached out of him, Anastasia was able to release him. Dad, Lex said, eyeing the blood spattered on Lord Petrick's shirt. The sight actually brought me satisfaction. Before I could order my brother to do anything else, Lady Valera hurried over to my father, her face stern. She rested a gentle hand on my father's shoulder, and he nodded. Forget it, Gwen, my father said, before storming out of the hall. Does that mean dinner's over? Karen asked. No. I'm still here, the lady reminded my sister. She walked over to the dais and primly sat in her seat. I was exhausted and didn't think that I could delve into her thoughts. I took another bite of my food, my stomach screaming for me to eat. What an eventful night, Lena commented, her eyes briefly meeting mine. She glanced at Lady Valera and shook her head. What the hell was that supposed to mean? I arched a questioning brow, but Lena's attention drifted elsewhere. Are you guys getting along? Anastasia inquired. She's nice enough, I offered, since I didn't want to make up a lie about how we were the best of friends. Lena detested me, and I knew it. She's weird. What was up with all the brow-raising and head-shaking crap? Anastasia whispered to me. I don't know, I said, not wanting to discuss Lena's motives. As long as she wanted to hurt our father, that was good enough for me. I couldn't believe that he had given my mother away in hopes of getting his son Obi returned to him. So, do you want to come to my room tonight? Sure, I said, deciding that Anastasia was my best option for gossip. Karen looked my way and shot me a grin. I returned it with a scowl, letting her know that her actions weren't going to be forgiven. Karen's eyes next landed on her mother, who must have said something, because Meg glanced at me with a nervous expression on her face. What was that about? I couldn't fish in anyone's mind tonight. I was too exhausted but I'd find the information one way or another.